What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 745. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources, and joining me online all the way from Denver, Colorado, coffee in hand, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, you got your coffee? You got your spin drift? The real question is, though, did you follow tradition and have a breakfast burrito today? Oh, I sure did. I, I, I figured no reason to break from tradition. And, uh, it, you know, it really is one efficient package that can fuel you who, through an entire review. That's right. And that's why I also, being the consummate professional that I am, had my breakfast burrito before doing our rare and set and mythic rare set review that we're going to do today. This is for Outlaws at Thunder Junction. That's right. It's set review time. We're going to cover all the rares, mythic rares, and all of the bonus sheet, which are called breaking news or something like that this time around. And we're going to be covering all of those cards today. And uh, let's see what these designers did. I was, you know, talking to our uh, live studio audience, as it were, before we started recording. We do, uh, we stream us rec uh, uh, recording the show. So that includes the pre-show uh, where we covered a wide range of topics today. Um, and you can, of course, get access to that on the Patreon, which is patreon.com slash limited resources. But I was telling them that I always try to put myself in the mind of the designers who made these cards kind of, what were you going for here? You know, especially when it comes to the rares, because you can tell the gloves really come off. But again, if you want to support us directly, it is patreon.com slash limited resources. Thank you so much to everybody who chooses to do so. Uh, the show is also brought to you by Ultimate Guard. They make the best stuff in the business, the highest quality, the most innovative, no joke. Like if you've ever tried out some of their products, they hit different. You hold one of their deck boxes in your hand and it feels awesome. They are substantial. They protect your gear. They last for a long time. They are awesome. Uh, sleeves, ways to organize your decks, your collection, etc. You can find it at Ultimate Guard. If you're interested, you can check out ultimateguard.com. You can buy Ultimate Guard products from your favorite local game store or your favorite online retailer. Thank you so much, Ultimate Guard, for your support of the show. Uh, Luis. We are going to be giving these cards a grade, uh, just like we did for the commons and commons review. How does that work? So we use an A through F grading scale with uh, two subgrades. And the A's are the bombs, the game winners, the best cards in the set, cards that are great in all sorts of different situations. And we're going to see a ton of those here today. They, they live in the rare and mythic review typically. We're talking cards like Aurelia's Vindicator or Azoni. Bs are cards that actively pull you towards their colors, or in this case, color pairs. Uh, just solid, you know, efficient removal, slightly overcosted creatures. Your your typical like, you know, four three flyer for four sort of thing is going to end up in the B range. We're talking cards like Reckless Detective and Neighborhood Guardian. Cs are playable. These are kind of the pawns of limited. They're fairly interchangeable, and you're going to end up with a bunch of these in your deck. Not going to see tons of Cs in the rare and mythic show. The rares tend to cluster at the high and low end of the scale. Speaking of which, we've got Ds. These are cards that are, you know, you could play them, but you feel a little bad when playing them. They're the low-end commons. They're cards that are slightly too expensive or too narrow. Kind of like mediocre combat tricks or bad removal often falls in here. Cards like Basilica Stalker or Defenestrated Phantom. Fs are cards that are basically just unplayable. Cards that cost 10 mana, cards that refer to planeswalkers. And uh, you see a lot of these in the rare slot because these are just cards that don't really function in limited, uh, but you could still open them in packs. Cards like Leyland of the Guild Pact is an example. And then you've got two subgrades. We have sideboard, which I don't really anticipate many sideboard cards in the rare review. Uh, these are cards that you wouldn't main deck, but can be pretty good out of the board. Cards that like pick your poison, though I I've kind of changed my view on that one in, in retrospect. I think that's <laughs> actually just a main deckable card. Sure, uh, sure. But we're talking cards that do something kind of situational, but great when they do it. Those are sideboard cards, and uh, we might see one or two of those. We will see a lot of the last subgrade, which is build a ground. These are cards that on their own don't do that much, but uh, if you support them correctly, they can be awesome. Cards like Chalk Outline uh, is, is a good example of a build around that, uh, you know, we'll probably see some of those in this review today. Yeah, those are the best ones. Those are the ones that I look forward to the most because those are the ones that it, when you're on draft 30 can change the way that you approach the whole draft if you open. So let's jump right in. Our first color this time is going to be black, just like we did on the Commons and Uncommons review. And that means our first card is a rare called Insatiable Avarice. This is black for a sorcery with Spree. So you can add two mana to it to search your library for a card, then shuffle and put that card on top. Oof. Or, and or I should say, you can add black black to have target player draw three cards and lose three life. 
I'm not super big into this because I look at this and I don't want to spend three mana to to Imperial Seal, right? To be Imperial right. Tutor, put a card on top of my deck because you're down a card that way. You, you have to skip your draw to get your card back. And yeah. I do like draw three, lose three, but black, 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 that's just Ouch. not a limited castable card. So I, I would actually give Insatiable Avarice an F. I just don't yeah. think that you're going to have the mana base to make this work. If you ended up mono black, this would be like a B level card. Black, black, black to draw three, lose three, and you might as well pay two to, to put a card on top, you know, while you're at it if you have the mana. But you're too often not going to be able to cast Insatiable Avarice. So looks like an F for us, which brings us into Tiny Bones. Tiny Bones joins up. So there's a cycle of these at rare across. There's some are multicolor, some are monocolor. They're all the different legends in the set joining up, they all are enchantments that are legendary that have a triggered ability that then when a legendary creature enters or does something or, or whatever, they have a second ability that keys off legends. So this one costs a single black mana at rare for a legendary enchantment that when it enters the battlefield, any number of target players each discard a card, which basically just means one black, your opponent discards a card. Okay. Mm-hmm mediocre start but at least you get your card back and then it, second ability is whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control any number of target players each mills a card and loses a life so this is an f i, I yeah yes it commits a crime when you play it so i, I guess maybe it's like a d because in a deck that really wants to commit crimes one black they discard a card commit a crime is passable but not very good and then i'm not really counting on my legendary creatures etb being and, and pinging them for one that's just right. not a big part of the card so i'd really only play tiny Bo- tiny bones joins up if i was hell bent on committing crimes and didn't have enough ways to do it but i would look at most ways past that yeah uh what about tiny bones the pickpocket <laughs> the legend itself uh this is also a single black mana for a legendary skeleton rogue so it's an outlaw it's a one one death touch and whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you can cast a non-land permanent out of their graveyard and spend any kind of mana for it. So you have to sp- pay the mana. Ooh. Yeah, this card's totally fine. One mana for a one on death touch that is an outlaw and a legend, which does matter, both of those things in this set is fine. And then they have to block it because if not, you get to cast a spell. Like you're not often going to get in for actual damage with this, but the threat of it will make them either block with something they don't want to block with or leave multiple creatures back. Because if they leave one creature back and you're like, kill your creature, attack, cast something out of your graveyard, like that's a pretty big blowout. So well, and, I would and actually that, give Tiny Bones a B. I would too. I, I mean, that, that sequence that you mentioned is actually, you know, pretty, like, especially if you can set up end step, kill your creature, then attack you, cast that creature, right? Yeah, I mean, you... Or play a cheap enough spell that you could do it do both. all in the same turn. Yeah, it has to be a non-land permanent card. So we're mainly yeah. talking about creatures that you're going to be getting back. But I mean, that's what you want back anyway. I like B for Tiny Bones, the pickpocket as well. That's great. Um, and plus, you kind of already had me at black for a 1-1 death touch. Like, <laughs> I've already played those anyway. Uh, next is Caustic Bronco. This is one and a black for a 2-2 snake horse mount at rare oh and by the way tiny bones the pickpocket is mythic so that's worth noting here there's right. only two mythics out of there uh but caustic broncos one and a black for a two two snake horse mount at rare and whenever it attacks reveal the top card of your library and put it into your hand you lose life equal to that card's mana value if caustic bronco isn't saddled otherwise each opponent loses that much life and the saddle cost is three Boy, if you could just get this. Wait, it's when it attacks? Yeah. So Caustic Bronco is actually really, really sweet. because That's awesome. It's not when it's saddled, you do the whole thing. It always gives you the top card. It just, if it's saddled, they take the damage. If it's not, you take the damage. But I'm just casting this on turn two, attacking them on turn three. And like, yeah, maybe I'll take five damage, but that's fine. And yeah. most of the time, you know, you're going to take less than that. Like the average CMC of your deck is going to be between a one and two, which means it's going to be a lot of zeros land and then some like fours and fives, but yeah. you still will be able to do it. And then in the late game where the life loss really matters, you can saddle it. And then all of a sudden there are the ones under the gun. So I would give Caustic Bronco a B plus. Like I think that definitely at any point in the game, when you cast this is going to be good. And late in the game, maybe you just send this in, draw your card, they take some damage, hopefully, and then you lose this, even a chump attack, you're still even on cards and maybe up on damage. Yeah, and there's also some nice lines of play that you can do. You know, you attack with it, you get the card. That could be the removal spell that you need to get it through. If they have multiple blockers, this is the tip, you know, for if you're playing against this card, 
it definitely makes sense to multi-block it, not just say, oh, I got a 2-2, sure, we'll trade. Because there is a world where they get their card off of it, then they let you block the 2-2 with another 2-2 or whatever with anything, and then they kill the thing that it's blocked with, which then unlocks another attack the next turn. And that could start to kind of get away from you pretty quickly. So I, I would be apt to put multiple creatures in front of this um, to make sure that it dies, even if they have one removal spell. Because, I mean, if Cossack Bronco, Bronco gets to attack twice or three times, like you're going to have a huge advantage over your opponent, even if you took the damage. Uh, next is Vadmir New Blood. This is one in a black for a 2-2 legendary vampire rogue at rare. And it says, whenever you commit a crime, put a plus one plus one counter on Vadmir. This ability triggers only once each turn. And as long as Vadmir has four or more plus one plus one counters on it, wow, it has menace and lifelink. Yeah, this card is awesome. Dang. It, it, so, you know, I, I did get to play the uh, early access event. It's actually going to inform my uh, opinions on a lot of these cards because I played for about seven hours. I did five drafts <laughs> and uh, almost everyone uh, of my friends watched, I, 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 as far as I can tell, all the ones who really <laughs> Dude, wanted to watch the stream. The, I missed the notification. Especially the ones who are just sitting at home working done. on their laptops anyway. <laughs> I know, I totally was. I'm going to watch it after. I'm, I'm going to fire up the VOD after we're done recording while I edit this podcast. I'll tell you that right now. Did you have a chance to play with Vadmir? No, but what 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 I what I did experience was how easy it was to commit crimes. It is very easy. It's just like in real life. If you want to commit crimes, it's just you know you you can do it. Like it's there, not hard there to do. Maybe it's but. hard to not get caught. But yeah. Uh, so I would look at this and be like, okay, I'm going to play this. And it's not even that playing it on turn two is necessarily what you want to do, though it's fine there too. It's just going to get a counter like every other turn, naturally maybe every two, every two to three turns without trying and every turn if you are trying like if you are drafting such that you can do it you can do the thing so i i was really impressed by how easy it was between the deserts between like random things like ravenous bloodseeker milling them for two committing a crime all that stuff so i i would be be happy to to run vadimir and in any deck and if you draft it of course you also get to build around it totally i, I this card seems like a reasonable base level. It's two, two for two, but it's not going to stay that way for long. And this is a total must kill. I mean, they have to kill it. And if you ever get to superpower mode, it's a six, six, at least menace with lifelink. I mean, that is awesome. That actually gives you a way to potentially draw Vadmir in the later part of the game and still build it up to be something that's going to be very, very relevant. Again, especially if you're a dedicated crime committer. Um, B plus for Vadmir New Blood? Yeah, I would, I would say B plus. Like, I think it's it's about the same as the... It's maybe... A, Maybe a little worse than Caustic Bronco, but not even always. So I, I think that they're both around the same category, which is B plus. Not quite like bomb bombs, but still very good. But first picks and really strong. Uh, next is Kervek the Punisher, which is one black black for a three three legendary human warlock at rare, and it says whenever you commit a crime, exile up to one target black card from a gra from your graveyard and copy it. You may cast the copy. If you do, you lose two life. So I, I had a sick sequence with Kervek where I, for, I first picked reanimate, which is a busted card. It's on like one of the, you know, nonsense sheets or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, it, it it's a, just an awesome card. This is one black mana for a sorcery, puts a creature into play from any graveyard and you lose life equal to the cost. But I, but I had to reanimate in my graveyard. I'd used it earlier and I had Kervek out and I go like, <laughs> play a thing, commit a crime, play reanimate. Cast reanimate commits another crime Oh, because if you reanimate one of their creatures, it, it commits a crime. And then I got to play a cheap black creature from my graveyard and I lost, you know, I lost a bunch of life, but I was already, I was ahead. So I was able to just snowball completely. Kerbeck is an interesting one. I actually would give Kerbeck a build around grade. I think it's like a build around a, okay. in that if you put enough cheap black cards in your deck, cause it doesn't have to be permanence. It doesn't have to be anything. It just has to be black, but, but it can be permanence creatures and stuff. Yeah, you can, you can, you, oh, it you, makes you a can, token. Yeah, you can make, you Whew. can make, so basically, that's great. Kerbeck lets you, every time you commit a crime, lets you just cast a black card out of your graveyard. Like that just goes cr completely crazy, especially with black cards that commit crimes themselves with enough mana. So I would want cheap black cards, some life gain, like Ravenous Bloodseeker is your, your friend here. This is the two mana, two, two life link that mills two. Cause at the start, you play it and mill yourself. Then later in the game, it commits a crime by milling them. And then you can replay it and the life gain helps with the Kerbeck and all that. 
So basically, it's a hugely threatening card that if your opponent casts it, you're going to want to kill it, which, you know, make makes me think it's, it's you can either give it a B or build around A. It's kind of the same grade where like, OK, it's a B in the average black deck. I would typically take and play this if I was playing black. But in a deck aimed to maximize it, it can be really good. OK, the art is just gnarly on that card, too. Uh, next is Rush of Dread, which is one black black for a sorcery at rare. It's It's got spree. And so you can add a mana to have target opponent sacrifice half the creatures they control round it up. You can add two more mana to have target opponent discard half the cards in their hand round it up. And you could add an additional two mana to have target opponent lose half their life rounded up. And of course you can pick and choose how, you know, one, two or three in any order or whatever that you want from these. So rounded up is the really important uh, kind of rider on this or like effect because the, the sweet spot is always going to be the odds. Cause right. if they have two creatures and you cast this, they sack one. If they have three creatures, this you sack two. Right. So that, that, that's an awesome upgrade. And you're typically not going to want to use both the second and third ability. You're mostly, you're most always going to play the first one. Sacking uh -huh. their creatures is like the big ticket here. And then you don't usually want to make them discard and lose their life at the same time. Sometimes you will, if you have all the mana in the world, sure. Spend eight mana, but Usually it's like either early you want to attack their hand. They have three, four, five cards in hand. You want to make them discard two, three, four cards or whatever. Or, well, four cards is hard. Discard two or three cards. Or you want to hit their life total because we're getting to the point in the game where it really helps to, to make them lose, you know, five to ten life. But I would look at it mostly as four mana. They sack two creatures on like turn turn four or five. And that's an awesome card. Like if your opponent has this card in their deck, if it's like, say game two and you know they have this card – try to trade off creatures as much as possible. Likewise, if this card's in your deck, try to avoid trading off. You want them to stack up as many creatures as possible. Because, I mean, if they go two, three, four in terms of curve and you cast this on turn four and they have to sack two creatures, it's an amazing card. Yeah, it's pretty good. Four mana, sack, they, they sack two creatures. is just great. Yeah. And then add, add to that, you get to sometimes nug them for some bunch of damage, sometimes make them discard some cards. Like, yeah, Rush of Dread looks like a B to me. I'm just yeah. going to always be happy to put this card in my deck. Yeah, it looks like a B to me as well. And I really like hitting like that sweet spot at three or five creatures is nice. Next is Pitiless Carnage, which is three and a black for a sorcery at rare. It says sacrifice any number of permanents you control, then draw that many cards. But it also has plot for one black black. Without the plot, I would absolutely not be interested in this because what you want to sacrifice are lands, but it's not really that helpful to sacrifice lands to draw cards right. past a certain point. Because let's say you have six lands in play and you're like, cast this, sack three lands, draw three. Well, how are you going to cast all those cards? Right. And sacking creatures to draw cards is usually not that exciting. But getting to plot this is interesting. What you can do is at some point you plot this, then let's say you have seven lands untapped late in the game, you go float some mana, sack a bunch of lands, and then just try to finish them off with that burst of cards. Okay. That does seem somewhat legit. I, I would still probably start this around the D range. Yeah. But I could see this being like kind of a finishing move type card, especially in an aggressive deck. And if you're making tokens, you can get some mileage too. White Black does have like a bit of a token theme. Yeah. It, the plot thing does make it an interesting twist, but the fundamental premise is still flawed. That you're spending a card to then sack permanence, which you either paid mana for or land drops or whatever, and then converting those into cards in hand is, is generally not a winning strategy. So I agree with you. D range for Pitiless Carnage, but eh, there's something kind of interesting there. Uh, last black card is Gisa the Hellraiser, which is three black black for a 4-4 four, four legendary human warlock at Mythic with Ward 2, pay 2 life. So to target this thing, you have to pay two mana and two life. And then it says skeletons and zombies you control get plus one, plus one, and have menace. And it says whenever you commit a crime, create two tapped two, two blue and black zombie rogue creature tokens. But wait, it only triggers once a turn. Are you <laughs> kidding me? I mean, Geese is just an A. This is, this is you know, this is our, this set's version of Grave Titan, where ideally you play this on turn six and just play a desert and then just get your two zombies right away. And at that point, at the very bare minimum, your opponent paid two extra mana plus the removal spell plus two life and you got two two twos out of the deal and if they can't kill gisa she made two three three menaces and then we'll probably make two more on the next turn i mean if you're if you're really good at it you can 
play this on like turn seven, go play Gisa, play a desert, ping, make zombies. On your turn, cast Skullduggery, make two more zombies, you know, totally. that sort of thing. So yes, Gisa's an A. Like, I would even just say A+. plus. Like this, you're not passing this card if you see it early. This is best card in this set territory for sure. My, my question for you is, would you routinely wait that extra, like however long oh, yeah. it takes for you to guarantee to get that if first trigger? If I had Gisa trigger? and one of the ping deserts in my hand, and I had enough lands that I didn't have to play it early, I would totally wait till turn six to well, lock in that What if it was value. more like, let's say you had a two mana spell that would trigger? No, I'm probably not waiting till turn seven. Okay. It'll depend on the texture of the game uh -huh. and who I'm playing against. I'm playing against white green. I'm just slamming this turn five. Playing against black red, I'll try to wait because I really do want to get the full value from okay. it. Okay. Yeah. And like you said, they make it painful. I mean, there's going to be some removal spells that just won't work, right? Like ward two will ward those off as it were, but... Yeah, so A plus for Giza the Hellraiser. That is incredible magic card. Um, that moves us to red, where our first card is called Great Train Heist. This is red with Spree. It's an instant and rare. You can add two and a red to untap all creatures you control. If it's your combat phase, there is an additional combat phase after this phase. You can add two mana to have creatures you control get plus one, plus zero, and first strike until end of turn. And you can add an additional red. It says choose target opponent. Whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to that player this turn, create a tapped treasure token. It's a weird card. Yeah, it, it, very flavorful. You get to like rob them. You get, you get some combat, a bunch of attacks, and then you carry off a bunch of treasure. Uh huh. So that's cool. When I'm looking at the spree cards, I think one way to evaluate them is like. And this is kind of what I did with uh, the Rush of Dread card earlier. Is there one mode that kind of makes the card legit? And if it is, there is, the other modes can be bonuses. And in this in this case, I think the Great Train Heist is red two. Your creatures get plus one plus zero oh, and first strike. Mm -hmm. Which is how okay. much do you like half a trumpet blast plus per first strike? Not that mm -hmm. much. In some decks, it's okay. Just like okay. it's not yeah. amazing, but like in a big combat, it's probably going to wreak some havoc. Also, it's actually really good uh, defensively. Like, because you can do some yep. nice double blocks. Two two twos can double block a six six, and you lose nothing. You know, that's true. That's true. And then you look at like, okay, well, what if I attacked with everything? And if they're like trying to play around this by not blocking, if you have enough mana to to cast it for the first two modes, which is six mana, you're like, bam, you take nine damage, untap all my creatures, attack again. They probably have to start blocking. And then if you got the extra mana to get a treasure out of it, like that can be really good. You'll you'll get like you know, two, three treasures per hit. Basically, if you want the middle mode, this card's probably worth playing. And an aggressive deck that has a lot of creatures, I think would play this card. You can also, I mean, casting it for red, red to just make two treasures on a, on an early turn, just if you have a good six drop in your hand is not like completely crazy. Mm -hmm. And there's a hidden mode on this card. Let's say they attack you and you, you have five mana, you can spend five mana Untap all your creatures, they get plus one, plus one, first strike, and you make a bunch of blocks. Oh, like, that's cool. You, you can kind of combine this. It, there's a lot of different ways to use this card. I think overall it's like a C plus. Like I'm not talking okay. a bomb, but I think that you should play this card in your creature heavy decks that are, you know, lean aggressive. Very flexible too, right? Because it says yeah. if it's your combat phase. So you that means any point during combat, which, you know, there's yes, you don't have points. to declare you're doing this before attacking. You right. attack them with some creatures. They make their blocks or don't. Honestly, what will happen some of the time with this is you attack. They won't block. You'll cast this for five mana, and now they have to block on the second go around, and they took a bunch of damage. Exactly. And I that, mean, imagine that's they're at really 12, nice and you attack them with three two twos. They're like, okay, no blocks. You're like, okay, take nine. Yep. attack you. Now you have to go chump, chump, chump because they're now at three. <laughs> exactly. So that's pretty cool. You know, so, and then of course you can do it the normal way too, where you go attack with these and they go block, block, block. And you go, okay, here we go. Untap everything. Give them all plus one plus oh, and then wipe out their board and then get a whole nother big attack. Honestly, in after I've that. talked myself up to a B on this card. Okay. But I think it's, I think it's flexible enough for that, but you do have to have a lot of creatures and be fast to get on the board. So like, don't put this in your like red, green monsters deck unless, you know, you, you, you're more of a like two, three, four drop deck than a five, six drop deck. Yeah. And, and I mean, look, the fact that you pointed out that you can use this defensively multiple ways also counts a lot because these cards are generally only good if you're attacking and generally only good if you're attacking with multiple creatures, which that doesn't happen every game. You know, sometimes you fall behind or you're losing the race or whatever, but great, 
great train heist gives you just enough flexibility there to get up into the B range. Pretty cool card. Uh, next is hell to pay. This is red X for a sorcery at rare. It deals X damage to target creature, create a number of tapped treasure tokens equal to the amount of excess damage that was dealt to that creature this way. Mm, how do you feel about this card? Just straight up red X sorcery. See, the thing is, Red X Sorcery Deal X to a Creature is not a card we would consider exciting in this day and age. Definitely not. You're just basically always down on mana. You spend four mana to deal three. You probably spent less than they did or more than they did. The fact that you can then, it unlocks a mode of pay one, put a tap treasure into play because, you know, this is all, all above their toughness. That doesn't really do much for me. I, I think this card's a C. Like, I would put it in the deck because it can kill things. And then, like, sometimes on turn five, you're like... Kill your two two flyer, make two treasures. That's kind of nice, you know. But yeah, I. But, but none of these scenarios are dreamy, right? Right. You, it's not you that exciting. Feel, so as, as you would say, it, it is isn't quite quite the rock rock reward for not <laughs> not a, not not that you know much of a, of a death metal card. <laughs> no, totally. And and you know, I one, one phrase that you like to use that I think is very apt to these type of situations is: Does it feel like you're getting away with something? And all right. of those scenarios that you described, it doesn't. So C for hell to pay. Uh, next is Magda the Horde Master. This is one in a red for a 2-2 legendary dwarf berserker. That means no outlaw, right? I can't remember if berserker is hey, Berserker is not an outlaw, no. Yeah, okay. And it's a rare. And it says, whenever you commit a crime, create a tap treasure token. This happens only once each turn. And then you can sacrifice three treasures to make a 4-4 red scorpion dragon creature token with flying in haste at sorcery speed. Magda's amazing. That's like, insane. Man, this... Again, you pick up treasures pretty easily with this card in play because a lot of things commit crimes. And then it just, even without the last second ability, I'd be pretty into this card as like, you know, two mana, two, two, that probably makes a treasure every couple turns or, and mm -hmm. or, or more, depending on what your deck's doing. But then all of a sudden, every time you stack three treasures, you just get a four, four. Like that, that's awesome. So M Magda gets a B plus from me. And yeah, in a deck that's really poised to use her, she's close to an A. Definitely. This is a hugely threatening card if built around and good, even if not. Uh, what does slick shot show off do? So there's a little, there's a little, uh, cheat code for, for the set. If it says slick shot, you probably want it in your deck. So, okay. uh, that, that, that has been my experience. So okay. this is one in a red for a one, two bird wizard. So not an outlaw. It's at rare. It's got flying and haste. And whenever you cast a non-creature spell, it gets plus two plus zero until end of turn. And it has plot one in a red. So the, Wow. Most of the time, you honestly are just going to go like play this attack for one. But if you have other cards that combine with it, it's a nice, efficient plot card. So imagine you're just like plot this so that uh, I can, you know, get my loan shark to draw me an extra card on turn four. Right. I wouldn't mind waiting a okay. turn or two to do that or okay. plot this so that my uh, outlaw stitcher makes a four four zombie on turn four instead of, you know, instead of a two two. Or what you can do is if and this is going to come up more in constructed because this card is going to see play. You plot this to make it so it's not exposed, and then when you have the turn where you're going to play two non-creature spells, you just pop this in, play those two, and just get your five points in. What that does is, yes, you miss out on maybe one or two damage from when it would have been in play attacking, but you lock in that like big hit where while well, they're probably tapped out or unable to deal with it. I see. So when in, in for our purposes, when I see the plot, it's actually how can I use this to affect other cards where in and it itself is actually just better on the battlefield on turn two attacking. Yeah. And okay. My experience, because I drafted the plot deck twice, actually. That's the only deck I drafted twice. It's really good, and there's a lot of cards that synergize with it, so I would be happy to play this card. Like, I'm I'm, I'm totally in. I think Slickshot Show Off is a B, and that's it's not quite a build-around because I think you're just going to play this most of the time, but there are, you know, there are things you can do to make it better, obviously. Having plot synergies, yeah. having, having non-creature spells, all that stuff. Man, but plus two, plus so prowess is, like, on a flyer? Like... That's a lot of extra damage coming across, no doubt about it. I mean, this is the type of card that turns combat tricks into like kind of a joke too. Nice card. Slick shot, show off gets a B, maybe a B plus. Next is Hellspur Posse Boss, which is two red red for a two four lizard rogue at rare. And it says other outlaws you control have haste. Doesn't give it to itself though. And it says when it enters the battlefield, create two one one red mercenary creature tokens with the pump ability. So I, I both had this in my deck and played against it. And 
Seems dumb. Much much like what you think when reading the card, it's amazing. So you're going to play this. What will happen is you go play this on turn four. Both my mercenaries immediately tap to make whatever my three or two drop that can attack bigger um, and just smash. And then later it's just giving all your stuff haste. If there's any way to bounce or raise dead this, you get more creatures. Also, there's just no way to interact with this on a one-for-one -one basis with your opponent. Like they can kill this and you got two one-ones for free. Right. Like – it, it, it's just not a reasonable card. Hellspore Prossy Boss is an A, and you don't have to do anything to make it great, but it is better in a deck with a bunch of outlaws, which kind of naturally happens anyway. Yeah. Uh, these are the types of cards that I value very highly because they can stabilize boards where you're behind, and they certainly put you ahead if you were at parity or ahead. So A for Hellspore Posse Boss. Next is Stingerback Terror, which is two red red for a dragon. Sweet. It's... Well, a 7-7 seven, seven Scorpion Dragon at rare with Flample. It's got Flying and Trample, and it has minus one, minus one for each card in your hand. Ah, wow, and you can plot it for two and a red. Yeah, Stingerback Terror is fantastic. Dang. A Scorpion Dragon sounds, sounds pretty scary. That is uh, cool, yeah. In the natural course of the game, this will get... You'll get down on cards just pretty easily, especially if you have this card in your deck. You're probably pushed towards drafting a low-curve red deck. And the plot is nice because you don't have to cast this on a turn where it would be kind of small and vulnerable. Like taking turn three off to plot this and then maybe not even putting it in on turn four, maybe putting it on turn five, it's already going to be like a five, five and it's not hard to get it to, to bigger. So I would just give Stingerback Terror an A. The only thing to note is don't put this in a deck with a bunch of card draw and reactive stuff and slow right. stuff. But if you can avoid doing that, the card is going to be going to be awesome. That is sweet. Yeah. And, and that's a, an A on just raw power, right? Just well, like the good news is we get to go from an A to an A plus because our next card is Terror of the Peaks. Terror of the this Peaks is, is back. This is a, a reprint. It's three Ugh. red red for a five four dragon at Mythic Rare. <laughs> it has flying. Spells that target Terror of the Peaks cost an additional three life to cast. So it's kind of like Ward. They would print this as Ward pay three life nowadays, but this that wasn't the technology back then. Mm -hmm. um, and here's the kicker. That would already be an A. Five mana, five, four flying that makes them pay three life to target it with spells, not abilities. Uh, would already be like an A, maybe A minus if you're feeling ungenerous. But the second ability is incredible. Whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control... Terror of the Peaks deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target. Which, first of all, is just completely ludicrous. It makes all your creatures into flame tongues that can either hit, can even hit your opponent's face. Where you play a 4-4, four, four, it nugs for 4 to anywhere. But this is a set with plot. So when you have this in your hand, you just plot two, a creature on turns 3 and 4. You get behind on board. You go down to 10. Turn 5, you go Terror of the Peaks. Immediately play my plotted creature, deal 3. And immediately play my other plotted creature, deal 3. Like... That's ridiculous. Uh, how Come completely on. absurd. So A plus for Terror of the Peaks. You need to do absolutely nothing to make this card work. And then when you do, it's even better. That's incredible. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, next is Calamity Galloping Inferno. This is four red red for a four six legendary horse mount at rare. It's got haste. So six mana, four six haste. And it says whenever it attacks while saddled, choose a non-legendary creature that saddled it this turn and create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of it. Sacrifice that token at the beginning of the next end step. Repeat this process once? So what what, what you do when you play what? Calamity is, it's a six mana, four, six. And obviously saddle, that's, saddles one, by the way. Yeah, cost, four, yeah. six haste. That's obviously fine. Like not great, but fine. But when you saddle it, what you get to do is you attack and you copy a creature that saddled it and then you do it again, but you don't have to choose the same creature if you don't want and you get tokens of those creatures that are, that are attacking as well that last just until end of turn. So can you get two of the same creature? You could, if you wanted to, okay. but you can saddle it with multiple creatures and then you get to choose one. I don't know why you choose different ones. That would be most of the time. It's just going to be a powerful. better one. Yeah. Like you have a five, five and a four, four, but it could be that you, you want to get a creature with an ET ability and then a different, and a big creature or something. Sure. Either way, this kind of plays like an overrun where let's say you start the turn with a 3-3 three, three in play. Well, Calamity comes down and then attacks with a 4-6 plus two 3-3s. Three, and the 3-3s three, are also tokens, so you don't even care if they die. So if they have a 4-4 four, four in play, you get to basically smash them for 7. You know, your two 3-3s three, plus this thing come in, they block a 3-3, three, three, take 7. And that happens right now. Right away, haste. Where it gets really gross is imagine you have any creature with an ETB and you're just like, <laughs> all right copy it twice, like get two ETBs. Like it's just, it's just crazy. So 
This one's, I think, an A minus just because. No, it's an A. I, I thought about it. It's not as good as Hellsper Posse Boss. It's like slightly worse than that because it's four versus six mana. If you're behind, you might not be able to use this. But it also just hits for so much damage that even if you are behind, maybe you can hit them for 10 and then they can't quite kill you on their turn and they have to leave stuff back. Yeah, or you just went out of nowhere. Yeah, or or you have a you know a creature like the 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 green creature that gains life when it ETBs and you sure. just like copy it twice totally. like that sort of or thing. Or you just have something with four power and you hit them for twelve and they didn't know any of it was coming, none of it. Like like if you're racing and they're like, okay, attack you with everything, get you down to three, and they're like, I'm at fourteen, I can't die, and you're like, cool, calamity, <laughs> you know, hit yeah. you for I eighteen. Mean, this is this is a card that's going to come out of nowhere in end games. I mean. Imagine you crew it with Terror of the Peaks, put two Terror of the Peaks in play, <laughs> take take 30 or whatever. Yeah, exactly. You might not that, even get to your attack stuff. That's the attack to win with Terror of the Peaks. Yeah. But, yeah. No, I would give Calamity an A. It's it's the kind sure. of card where you will die out of nowhere if you don't if you don't respect this card. Yeah. Um, the good news, the A's aren't done yet because we're moving on to green. And Gold Vein Hydra is the first card. It's X and a green for a Mythic Rare Hydra. It has it comes into play with X plus one plus one counters on it. So okay. it's five mana for a four four or six mana for a five five. It's got vigilance, it's got trample, it's got haste. And when wow. it dies, it makes treasures uh, equal to its power, though they do come in tapped. Wow. <laughs> We've got a long way since X and a green creature was just like good by itself. This yeah. is I mean, let's just use the use case of five mana. F- five mana four four vigilance trample haste dies into four treasures is an absurd card that's insane. and this is so much better than that because sometimes it's a four mana three three if you're on four lands sometimes it's a seven mana six six like whatever you want vigilance plus haste plus trample means you just always play this and immediately attack there's just no downside wow that's I, awesome i mean gold vein hydra is an a like this yeah. card's good at basically every stage of the game that's that's again a raw power play that's that's a great card really cool too Next is Smuggler's Surprise, which is green with Spree. It's an instant at at, uh, rare. And you can add two mana to mill four cards. You may put up to two creature and or land cards from among among the milled cards into your hand. You can add four and a green to put the two. you, You may put up to two creature cards from your hand onto the battlefield. And you can add one extra mana to have creatures you control with power four or greater gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. So where's the where's the single use case place where we're happy here? Four GG put two creature cards on from my hand onto the battlefield. Probably not. What about two and a G mill four, and I can get up to two creatures or lands from those four cards and put them in my hand. So that that's going to be the, I think base rate on this card. Like how often do you play kind of greater gift at instant speed where you mill four and you hopefully draw two, which most of the time you will in a deck yeah. that includes this, right? Mm-hmm. And then you also have a combat trick of one and a green to give your creatures with four power hexproof and indestructible, which kind of narrow because it only protects your big creatures, but you know, still, still a thing. And then you combine them and all of a sudden you're like, you know, you're looking at eight mana to mill four, put two creatures into your hand, uh, and then put two big creatures into play to hopefully block. Yeah. So I don't really see what you're probably not using the the last ability very often in conjunction with the other two, but you could, I mean, you could go for I the can, full nine. <laughs> well, I could also imagine a trade where like, let's so use your whole turn, but imagine on turn five or something, they, you attack with your four, four, they block with their four, four, you spend four mana and you're like, make my thing indestructible, win the combat. And then also just mill my, mill these cards and draw two cards. Like true. It's kind of a decent combat trick. It, so, it is. And, and it's not that mana intensive at, at G and three, like that's not too bad. I think overall this card's probably closer to a C than any other grade. I would just give it a C. But this is the one that like I kind of want to play. Like if you have a deck with a ton of creatures, some some kind of big creatures in your deck, you have a decent amount of four power creatures, like a red green monsters deck that has kind of a high curve. I can see this being a decent support card, but it, it's a lot of situational cards and most of it doesn't affect the board. So I'm a little hesitant, but I would give Smuggler Surprise a C and say there's room to go above that. Yeah. That's an interesting card, at least. Next is Bristly Bill Spine Sower. This is one and a green for a 2-2 legendary plant druid at Mythic. It has Landfall, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. Nice. And 3GG, double the number of plus one, plus one counters on each creature you control. I mean, this card's just absurd. That's awesome. 
two minute two two that landfall put it gets a plus one plus one counter is this just a great card that's like yeah. a b yeah and this gets to move the counters to where you want which is always great because this card's such a must kill that putting counters on other things just guarantees you'll leave value behind mm-hmm. and it just gets to spend five mana to put another two or three or four counters across all your creatures depending on you know how much work you've done before that like bristly bill is an a there, there aren't very yeah. many situations where this is bad. Yeah, when you have seven lands out, none in play, and you top deck this, maybe it's a little anemic. But look at the situation where you draw this on turn seven and have one land in your hand. You're like, play Bristly Bill, play a land, put a counter somewhere, spend five, put another counter somewhere, if I had none to start with even. Right. Next turn, if I draw a land, all of a sudden I play a land. Now I have two, two maybe three counters, activate the ability. Just It went off from almost nothing yes. in the late game. And on turn two, of course, this card's just unbeatable if they can't kill it. Totally. And it is double the number of, I mean, anytime you see the word double on a magic card, your eyebrows should go up because that gets out of hand really quickly. Yeah. I like a for Bristly Bill Spine Sower. That card's card. awesome. I'm, I'm putting this one in the vintage cube. I actually, mm-hmm. uh, I'll, I'll probably talk a little more about it in the sign up, but I have a lot of cards I want to put in the set from the cube. It's about Sweet. 20. That's, wow. That's a, oh, that's most a of any set that I can recall. That's awesome. Next is Free Strider Lookout. This is tuna green for a three, three human rogue at rare. It's got reach. And it says, whenever you commit a crime, look at the top five cards of your library. You may put a land card from among them onto the battlefield tapped, put the rest on the bottom in a random order, and this ability triggers only once each turn. Fantastic card. That's, three minute, three, three reach is already just playable card. You know, one I'd be, be all right with. And then every time you commit a crime, you get a land into play. You're going to thin out your deck pretty quickly because this puts your cards on the bottom. So... Pretty soon you're going to loop back around. I'm glad it's random order so you don't have to keep track of it. I always kind of get annoyed because this card can go through your library. This card could trigger like four times pretty easily. So How do you feel about it being green? Like because the other cards we've seen that are crime committers have been red and black. Yeah, it's going to make it a little bit harder. uh, But there's still plenty of ways to commit crimes. The deserts Mm -hmm. alone. Like turn four. Mm -hmm. I mean, just think about this turn four play. Turn four, play this, play a desert, put a land into play. Like you just ramped and got an extra card. Yeah. And and you're the only thing it's asking you is that you play a three, three reach for three. Like you'd already kind of want that anyway. What do you like for a free starter lookout? Like B plus. Yeah. I like B plus for the lookout. Next which is brings us to <laughs> ornery tumble wag. So I was very mad tumble wag. It's two and a green for a two, two brush wag mount at rare. <laughs> at the beginning of combat on your turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. Awesome. We could stop there. I mean, Jeez. two and a green for a two-two Luminarch Aspirant, right? Like, yeah. just, just amazing. And when it attacks while saddled, double the number of plus one, plus one counters on target creature. Come on. This is, I don't know. I actually don't really know why both of these cards are in the same set at, like, similar rarity here, where it's like yeah. they both put a counter every turn and they both double counters, so it's kind right. of weird. Like, um, would say that's a little sloppy, but uh, these cards are both fantastic in terms of gameplay. Like, what, What's the saddle they, cost? Two, saddle two. So mm-hmm. basically you're just like, play this. Immediately it's a 3-3. Three, three. Next turn it's a 4-4 four, four saddle attack, and now it's a 6-6. Six, six. Like, because you're going to want to put the counters on this a lot of the time because you want to attack and have it survive. But even if you don't, like, even if you just go play this, put a counter on my other creature, next turn put a counter on my other creature, like, I mean, you don't even have to attack with this to have it be a must kill. I would give the tumble wagon A as well. Yeah, I would too. This, this card's going to be absolutely huge or grow out your board in a very, very quick fashion. And this one doesn't even need landfall. Huh? You could even trigger your crime committing. <laughs> like you could target yeah, the number. If you really wanted to, you just, could put a counter on their creature and commit yeah. a crime. That sounds like a crime to me. Well, but, I, I meant know, the middle one. I meant the middle one. Whenever it attacks while saddled, double the number of plus one, plus one counters on target creature. You oh, could just yes. target theirs, even if it doesn't have any weird um next is outcaster trailblazer which is two and a green for a four two human druid at rare and when it enters the battlefield add one mana of any color it says whenever another creature with power four or greater enters the battlefield under your control draw a card oh and there we go it's got plot for just two and a green the same cost but now when you unplot it you get that extra mana that you can use to, to really bump yourself up. It's hard to imagine, you know, playing this and then casting something else in the same turn too often. It has to be a pretty cheap spell, but if you plot it, then it's, you know, now you're game on. I'm starting to think plot is just a really good mechanic because it's not that complicated and it's really satisfying. Like it just, the cards with plot just work. 
I played against this in the early access, and it's just they went turn three, plot this, which, sure, they didn't affect the board that turn, but that's fine. Turn four, put this into play, play a four or a five drop, draw a card. E- easy as pie. Like, that's super The trailblazer cool. is just fantastic. I, I would give this an A-. It, you oh, know, really? It's so often going to be a mana ramp plus cantrip. That, that's just such a great card. That is great. And even after it draws its first card, your opponent still has to kill it. I mean, I sure did. Because mm-hmm. what because when they go turn four, you know, unplot this, you know, they plot it on turn three, play this turn four, play their four four, draw a card. You think that with the extra card and now five mana on their next turn, they're not going to draw another card? Like you totally. don't want to take that gamble. You're going to kill it. So. No, and that's like a real feel bad, right? When they yeah. just got their value off of it and you have to kill the card anyway, that's and, when you know and, you're behind. Yeah, and it also gives you like a, it fixes your mana if you're a multicolor deck, like because mm-hmm. plotting this and then and then playing it next turn with all your mana on tap makes it pretty easy to play another card. So yeah, that's sweet. Yeah, B plus A minus range for Outcaster Trailblazer. Next is Colossal Rattle Worm. This is two GG for a really a six five worm at rare, <laughs> and it has flash as long as you control a desert. And it has trample. Where's the bad news here? Uh, you can pay one in a green and exile it from your graveyard to search your library for a desert, put it on the battlefield, tapped, and then shuffle. I'm done reading. Like, this is a four mana six five trample with all upside. I, I was waiting for minus one, minus one for each, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, you have to get these deserts in to make I mean, it I, full size. This is just I've straight seen up. the other other rares in the set, so I wasn't waiting for that. <laughs> like, wow, the, the cards are just pushed now. I mean, this is this is going to be one of the leading contenders for like the game ends on turn four when you attack with your you know four three, and they're just like rattle worm block. Oh, when your green opponents on. play nothing on turn four, get a little suspicious, and then. It even is just like when at some point when after it dies, you just go get a, a desert, which commits a crime. Like this, this card is just, just, just really, really strong. So I would give Colossal Rider Worm an A. Me too. You know, even if you don't have flash, even if you just put in your green deck with zero deserts and it can't even use the other ability, you're just casting on turn four. What, what, what's the downside? It's a four mana, six, five trample. So that's just incredible. That's also very difficult to kill. Like five toughness is a lot. Wow. A for Colossal Rattle Worm. I'm still waiting for the other shoe to drop on that thing, but I guess worms don't wear shoes. Next is Railway Brawler, which is three green green for a 5-5 five, five Rhino Warrior at Mythic Rare. It's got Reach and Trample, and it says, whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, put X plus one plus one counters on it where X is its power. Are you kidding me? And this thing has plot for three green. <laughs> what? And so, first of all, the plot's cheaper than the cost. But second, you just go turn four, plot this, turn five, play this, play any creature, and you have a 10 10 and a 5 5. And play. It's just a joke. Crazy. The green rare The green rares, I mean, look look at the, there's eight green rares, and it's like A, C, A, B plus, A, 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 basically. That's incredible. And actually, I think Railroad Baller is actually an A plus. Like I think it is it is literally an A plus because it's a four mana five five reach trample that that just drops four or five plus one plus one counters, and that's assuming you played one creature. Imagine you get play two creatures after playing this. Like, imagine you plotted a creature on turn three, and then turn four you plot, and you're just like, all right, again, I'll take a bunch of damage, I'll get behind on board. Now I have twenty power on the board, literally, because your the three drop you plotted comes in, the four drop you plotted comes in. One's a six six, one's an eight eight, and then you have this. That's unbelievable. And the only window that they have to not have this completely destroy them is you plot it, you play it, it's on the battlefield, and then they put another creature on the stack and they have to have an instant speed way to kill a 5-5. Five, five. And then they kind of get out of it. Yeah, I mean, it's And, not and it's really a one realistic. for one. It's not like they're ahead. <laughs> that yeah. is incredible. Yeah, A, A plus for Railway Brawler. <laughs> what the... Yeah. Um, let's move to white. I can't take any more of those green rares. Good Lord. That worm. I still waiting for the bad news on that thing. Um, first white card's called final showdown. It is white with, with spree. It's an instant at mythic and you can add one mana to have all creatures lose all abilities until end of turn. You can add one mana to have, uh, choose a creature you control. It gains indestructible until end of turn. So that happens after all the abilities are gone, right? So yeah, there you things go. happen in order. Mm-hmm. And then you can add three white white to destroy all 
creatures. This card's another bomb. Uh, I, I played against this, and I didn't really know about it. Uh-huh. And my opponent just cast an instant speed wrath. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, six mana to, to destroy all <laughs> creatures at instant speed is pretty sick. But the real disgusting part is seven mana, destroy all but one creature. It's Dune Blast. Yes, instant speed Instant Dune speed Blast. Dune Blast. And if you really need it to, it can be a two mana, give a creature indestructible. Or, or a two mana, creatures lose all abilities, which that one's not going to come up so often. But... Every now and then, it'll, it'll do something kind of neat. Like you could cast this on the stack. Uh, oh no, I guess it doesn't. It doesn't stop an ETB because it's not like dress down, which stays in play and does this. So you can't stop oh. an ETB with this, but you can you can stop a lot of other stuff. And definitely, mostly this is just the Dune Blast effect. So I would give this an A. I mean, Dune Blast is an A. <laughs> like yeah, but this is instant speed and only one color. Like that's yeah. Oops. Wow. Well, I think. White, white, white four is probably harder to cast <laughs> in this format than than Obzon plus four was it in uh, in cons. Be. But anyways, final showdown gets an A, and uh, that leads us to a better white card actually, Dust Animus. <laughs> it's one and a white for a two three flying spirit at rare. If you control five or more untapped lands, it enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters and a lifelink counter on it, and it has plot one and a white. Oh my! Are you serious? So this, I, I got to play with this one. It was nice. You, you just plot this on turn two, and then on turn five, you get a four or five lifelink. That's it. With There's, flying. With flying. And <laughs> if you draw this in the late game and have seven lands, you just tap two of them and play it, and you still get the four or five lifelink. It's a two mana four or five flying lifelink. That's crazy. And and then if, the you, fail if case you just have two like mana, a two three. Four. Right. If you just have like a good aggressive curve out style draw, you can just slam it on turn two and start piling in damage yeah. with it. I would honestly give Dust Animus an A+. Plus. A two mana, four or five flying life yeah. is just a ridiculously obscene card. It is. And that actually is the type of card that stabilizes tough boards and of course crushes if you're at parity or ahead. It's even amazing in developing. This is the Quadrant Theory all-star right here. Oh yeah. Wow. Uh, what about High Noon? It's High Noon. It's one and a white for an enchantment at rare. Each player can't cast more than one spell each turn. Boo. Sounds boring. Yeah. Uh, and then four and a red, <laughs> sacrifice High Noon. It deals five damage to any target. So this is kind of a hoser for the blue-red deck because it turns off all their like double spell stuff. Mm-hmm. And then hopefully in your deck, it doesn't really matter. You need to be playing red though because you want to be able to cash it in later. The card is not good enough unless you can cash it in later. Or you could sideboard it in against a good blue-red deck. They'd have to have a pretty good deck with like a lot of the cards that function off two spells. But if they do, this card could turn off a decent amount of those. Would you main deck it? I would not main deck it unless I was red-white. But if I was red-white, I I would consider it. Okay. Is this the rare sideboard card? Maybe it is. Um... I, I, I consider it both a sideboard card and and not. Like, it is a sideboard card, but you could also main deck it in a red-white deck. Yeah, I mean, it has to. you have to be able to pop it, right? There's just yeah. no situation in Limited where you're going to even sideboard this in <clears throat> uh, if you can't pay the red. I, I would give it, like, a sideboard C or something. I mean, you're, you're never getting anything amazing here. You, you could shut off some aspects of one of the decks, but they can still cast spells. It's not like you're, they, they can't win or something. And then, you know, the paying five extra man or whatever is kind of tough. Yeah. I would say it's like a sideboard B though. Like okay. if you're red, white and you sideboard this in against blue, red, I feel like you're going to get a lot of mileage out of it. I suppose this is not one of the cards that you're excited to put in your vintage cube. <laughs> no, no, it is not. <laughs> Shuts uh, down everything you want to do. Uh, what about another round? It's a weird one. So it's X, X, two and a white to, ca- to cast sorcery at rare. So okay. if X is one, it costs five mana, for example. Uh-huh. XL, any number of creatures you control, then return them to the battlefield under their owner's control, then repeat this process X more times. So for <laughs> two and a white, you can exile all your creatures and then come to have them come back, basically re-trigger your ETBs. And then every two mana you spend does it does it again. This looks like an F. I don't really think you're going to build a deck where you want this effect at sorcery speed. Obviously, no. if it was instant speed, that'd be a very different thing. Right. But I'm thinking another round looks like an F to me. I will, I will not take another round. <laughs> I think so, too. It is funny, though, and I could see something cool happening with it. Uh, next is Avon Interrupter. This is one white white for a 2-2 bird rogue with flash and flying at rare. And it says, when Avon Interrupter enters the battlefield, exile target spell, it becomes plotted. Weird. And then it says, spells your opponents cast from graveyards or from exile cost two more to cast. 
That's pretty cool. Yeah, this card's pretty good. Like, you know, you 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 leave your mana up for this on probably not turn three though. Maybe maybe turn three, and just go bam. You know, counter your like spell quill or your thing, uh-huh. and then they can play it next turn, but they have to spend two on it. So it's like kind of like it delays their spell by a turn. Plus adds two. Plus it just randomly hoses all their other plot cards. So again, this is a card that against blue red randomly could make it so they spend four or six mana over the course of the game, as well as delaying a spell. And it's a two-two flyer for three with flash. So and and it, also isn't plot sorcery speed only? It is also sorcery speed only. So, so if you if you plot if you get a combat trick or yeah. a counter if you get a counter spell with this they can never play it. At it's all. just gone. It's just yeah. gone. If you get a combat trick with this, you're really making it not that effective. Yeah, interesting. That's a cool card. I mean, it seems pretty powerful and also just really cool. Would you uh, like a B for even interrupter? I would give B, B for even interrupter. I think I think yeah. it's a good one. Uh, claim jumper. This is two and a white for a three, three rabbit mercenary at rare. It's got vigilance. And when it enters the battlefield, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for a planes card and put it onto the battlefield tapped. Then if an opponent controls more lands than you repeat this process once, if you search your library this way, shuffle. Basically, it catches you up, and then if you're still not caught up, it tries to do it again. So if they have five lands and you have three, you you go get two planes, which is That's nice. It's kind of well, cool. I mean, even just on the draw, casting this as a three-mana, three-three vigilance that goes and gets a planes is great. That's really if, good. If you end up in a situation where they have multiple more lands than you, you could even get multiple lands off this. I like B for Claim Jumper. Just Me really too. a solid card. Yeah, and, and if you're on the play... And you're not getting the bonus. You're still getting a reasonable 3-3 Vigilance for three. Next is Fortune Loyal Steed. This is two and a white for a 2-4 Legendary Beast Mount at rare. And it says when it enters the battlefield, scry two. So three mana, 2-4, scry two. That's pretty good. Saddle cost is one. And it says whenever it attacks while saddled, at the end of combat, exile it. And up to one creature that saddled it this turn, then return those cards to the battlefield under their owner's control. Nice. You know, this is the perfect stats for that, right? Not only do you get the scry two again, but a two four on blocks is nice. And a two four on attacks is kind of tough to, you know, it takes usually multiple creatures. That's a really cool design. Humphreys really likes two fours. There's a lot of three mana two fours in the set. There, there's like five or something. He's going, he's going back to the old days. Oh, blocking is great. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, you cast this three mana two four scry two is just a, kind of a decent card. Not amazing, but decent. And then it can blink a creature with an ETB. One thing to note is if you saddle this and attack and this dies in combat, the other creature still will get blinked at the end of the end of, at the end of combat. Okay. And that's this, good to know. if this survives, it'll basically have vigilance and you get to scry two again. Mm-hmm. So it's got a lot of little value things added up. This makes fortune a B. It's it's, yeah. it's just a solid card. Fortune looks like a B and, and it definitely has the ability to be one of the better cards in your deck if you can uh you know if you could really go off with it. Uh next is one last job. This is two and a white. With Spree, it's a sorcery at rare. Its Spree costs are plus two return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Okay. Uh, Plus one return target mount or vehicle card from your graveyard to the battlefield. And plus one return target aura or equipment card from your graveyard to the battlefield attached to a creature you control. And again, these do happen in order so you could attach it to something that you brought back. Interesting. So you know, the two and a white plus two plus one. So the first two modes is six mana, but you could get back effectively two creatures. You could get a mount and a creature from your graveyard to the battlefield. Basically, basically the way I look at this card is in a deck without mounts or vehicles, it's like a D. Like I'm just not interested in five mana, bring a creature back. But if I can get six mana, bring a creature plus another creature back. That, then I'm interested in that because in, yeah. in, in, in like a green white deck that has say three creatures with mount or mounts, I guess, uh, then often enough, this is six mana, put two creatures back into play from your graveyard. Like that, that's a good rate. It At is. this point you're, you're starting to profit. Definitely. And if you, you know, happen to have a bomb or something, you know, one last job goes up a little bit as well. I, you know, this still looks like a C to me, like not an absolutely amazing bomb or anything, but you know, a solid C for one last job. What do you think? I would say it's a D or a build around B. Like in in a normal deck, it's a D and I don't want to play it. In a deck that I can build around it, it's like a B. Like if you can if you can put this into a good green-white mount deck, then 
I would, I, this is going to be like in your top, you know, eight cards or so. For sure. Uh, last white card is Archangel of Tithes. This is one white, white, white for a three, five flying angel at mythic rare. Buckle up. As long as Archangel of Tithes is untapped, creatures can't attack you or planeswalkers you control unless their controller pays one for each of those creatures. And as long as Archangel of Tithes is attacking, creatures can't block unless their controller pays one for each of those creatures. God, that's annoying. Really annoying ability, but the triple white is such a beating. That like, is really tough. If this costs three and a white, this card would be an A. As right. is, I think it's like a C because you're not casting this. It, let's say you play like 10 planes and seven islands or something in your blue white deck. You're still not casting this on turn four very often. You're no. casting it on like turn six. Yeah. And yeah, that just puts you into a spot where the abilities get weaker and weaker as the game goes on. So I, I would say Archangel of Tithes is kind of like a build around B where if you can build a mana base with 11 or 12 planes, then yeah, the card gets to B A range in the average deck. Probably uh, you probably still play it because a three, five flyer is still good on turn six or seven, but it gets a lot worse. So I would just call this a build around the build around being, how do we get three white mana? The mana. Yeah. So nice one. Archangel of Tides. It combines That's... nicely with that black card that puts a four cost creature into play. Like <laughs> yeah. You, in, yeah. in black, white, you can pay four mana to tutor up and play this card. Like that is actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Cheat this into play. Now you're talking business for sure. All right. That's going to do it for white. And that'll move us to blue. Our first blue card is three steps ahead. It's blue. Uh, with Spree, it's an instant at rare, uh, and its Spree costs are plus one and a blue to counter target spell, so you get a cancel, uh, plus three to create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control at instant speed, uh, and then plus two, draw two cards, then discard a card. Wow. That's going like to go this. in the cube. That's a cool card. <laughs> yeah, it's on my list. Uh, I'm not sure if it'll ultimately make it, but uh, so for limited... The baseline of cancel is on the weaker side for most formats. You, mm. you usually don't want to play it, but this isn't just cancel. It's cancel or three in a blue instant speed, make a token that's a copy of one of your own creatures or blue into two, draw two and discard a card. And then of course you can mix and match and combine them all. I mean, if you, if you spend the full eight mana, then you're, you're probably just going to blow them out because you're going to yeah. counter their spell, make a creature, draw two and discard a card. But even just, Imagine six mana, copy your four, four, draw two cards and discard a card. as like you built your own mold drifter there. Yeah, that's really good. Um, and then it's always got that cancel buyout of like, if I need to, I can use this to counter their spell on turn six. So I think three steps ahead. I would honestly give this like B plus A minus level card. Just I because would too. It's flexible. It's powerful. And it's got modes that are good at pretty much every point in the game. The weakest part is if you don't have double blue early and you can't, you know, leave up the cancel mode and then it's kind of stuck in your hand. Maybe you don't have a good creature to copy, but if you don't have a creature and you have the mana, you can just cancel, draw two and discard a card. Five mana to counter a spell, draw two and discard a card is also good. Like, yeah, there's no combination that's not good here unless you're like in desperation casting three mana, draw two, discard. Right. And they also were very merciful with the mana. It, it's blue. And then if you want to counter, it's an additional blue, but the other two modes do not require more blue. Like they could have easily made it two and a blue, for the create a token and then made it like a lot more blue centric, but it's really not like, or at least it doesn't have to be. Yeah. I like B plus a minus for three steps ahead. I can't imagine a scenario where this card isn't decent at least. And the upside of playing it, the later the game goes, the better it gets. Even in a creature light deck, wow. treating this as a cancel that you can pay an additional two to draw two cards and discard a card is just great. It's so. already good. I, I would like to be three steps ahead. I usually am. Um, next up, we've got <laughs> Archmage's Newt. It's one in a blue for a 2-2 Salamander mount at rare. It's got the uh, dubious distinction of being the first one in a blue 2-2 blue creature with no drawback, apparently. But uh, Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And it says, when, whenever this deals combat damage to a player, target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard gains flashback equal to its uh, uh, flashback until their turn. The flashback cost is equal to its mana cost. That card gains flashback zero until end of turn instead if this is saddled, and it has saddled three. Okay. This card's just fine. I mean, it's a two-mana 2-2 two -two that on turn two is just a 2-2. Two -two. It doesn't really have other abilities. But it plays nicely with uh, with some cards, like the the blue minus one minus O draw card is nice. Mm -hmm. Imagine you play this on two. They play their 2-2. Two -two. You attack. If they block, you just cast that draw card, win the combat. 
If they don't, you can just cast that and then post combat cast it again to draw two cards. Sure. And if you do saddle this, you can play something gigantic, but that's not a really big part of the card. Mostly, it's a two mana two two with slight upside, which I think makes it a C. Honestly, it's yeah, not I think like it's a C. Yeah, it's not a it's not an amazing card. Yep, uh, Duelist of the Mind is one in a blue for a star three human advisor at rare. It's got flying and vigilance. This is. By the way, Nathan Stoyer's World Championship card. Congratulations, Nathan, for that. Uh, Duelist of the Mind's power is equal to the number of cards you've drawn this turn. And whenever you commit a crime, you may draw a card. If you do discard a card, this ability triggers only once each turn. Yeah, I've, I've been impressed with this card. I got to play with it once. And it's a two mana O3 flyer on their turn most of the time. On your turn, it starts at 1-3 because you've drawn a card for your turn. And then when you attack, they kind of have to treat it as if it was a 2-3 mm -hmm. because it's really easy to instant speed, commit a crime, draw a card. So they're not blocking this with their 2-2 flyer very often. And um, when you attack with this, you know, you sometimes get multiple damage in. Also, just a looter that just sits there and loots every turn you commit a crime is going to, A, find you more cards that commit crimes, and B, just increase your overall card quality over the course of the game. While it's doing that, it's whacking them for two, maybe sometimes three or four a turn if you cast some card draw spells. So I think that uh, Duelist of the Mind is a solid card on all fronts. You don't really have to do much to enable it, but it gets better if you do. Like in a blue-black deck that's focused on crimes, this is going to be better than a blue-white deck, but I'd basically always play this card. So I, I would give Duelist of the Mind a B. Really yeah. solid card. It looks like a B, and if you're really committing crimes, it gets to the B-plus range. Next is Jace reawakened this is blue blue for a three loyalty legendary planeswalker jace at mythic it has a static ability you can't cast this spell during your first second or third turns of the game <laughs> ouch uh it does have two plus one so the first one is plus one draw a card then discard a card the second one is plus one. You may exile a non-land card with mana value three or less from your hand. If you do, it becomes plotted. And then it does have an ultimate of minus six. And it says until end of turn, whenever you cast a spell, copy it. You may choose new targets for the copy. I think that the, the first clause is... It's relevant. Obviously, if you had two islands in your opening hand, you'd want to cast this on turn two. But it's mostly like to keep it out of constructed, like being too broken in constructed range. Mm -hmm. But I think this card is just really good because a two mana card, even on turn six, it's still a two mana card. You get to play a four mana card alongside it. And what Jace ends up doing is it sits there and either loots or basically adds mana. Like playing this and plus oneing on a three drop it kind of adds, it's like it added three mana. And then next turn you have a four loyalty Jace that you can either loot with or use the plot as well as you have a three drop just coming into play to help defend Jace. The ultimate's not that impressive, but you know, you can, you can set it up nicely with the like plus one to going from five to six and the next turn ultimating playing the card you plotted plus casting another card is pretty good. Mostly I look at this as like a card you'd play on turns like, you know, five or six, maybe sometimes turn four if you can play something alongside it to defend it, that your opponent kind of has to deal with. If they, if, if your opponent has a Jason play on like four or five loyalty, what are you going to do? You have to try, try to do something to deal with it. It's definitely annoying. I, th this is one of those rare, fair-ish Planeswalkers, right? Like this is not make your jaw drop, but it's like there's a lot going on here. It's interesting. Um, it just isn't hit you over the head powerful, right? Which yeah, I'm, it's kind of refreshing. I mean, unlike every green card in this in the set, right. right? Like right, like every single green card is like, oh, this is an A. It's a five five that gives counters, a two two that gives counters, a different two two that gives counters. They're all just busted, right? So, right. J Jace is a really solid card. Like it is very good. It's very similar to Duelist of the Mind. I'd also give it a B. It's just a good value card. You're getting good value for the mana you spend. Like if you spend two mana, get two loots out of this, they attack it a few times, maybe have to make a kind of bad attack at one point or use a removal spell to get through. Like you got your money back. You, you don't need this Definitely. to be a, a game ending card for it to be worth playing. And I would actually give Jace a B plus. I think every deck that plays blue is just going to be happy to put Jace in the deck. Agreed. B plus for Jace Reawaken. Next is the key to the vault, which is one in a blue for a legendary artifact equipment at rare. Uh, it says whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, look at that many cards from the top of your library. You may exile a non-land card from among them. 
put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order, you may cast the exile card without paying its mana cost, and the equip cost is two and a blue. No flying, no stats, no way to get through. You're spending yeah. five mana up front for one of your creatures to hit, and when you put it on a small creature like a 1-1 one, one flyer, you're not even getting that much value out of it. Look, looks like an F to me. I think so too. These type of cards, th they have a dream associated with them, but unless there's a set mechanic that helps push cool it through, zero mana. It, right, it doesn't end up actually happening. So F for the key to the vault. Next is Fibble Thip. Yeah, Fibble Thip. Uh, lost on the range. This is one blue blue for a 1-1 one, one legendary homunculus at rare with ward two says you may look at the top card of your library anytime. The top card of your library has plot. The plot cost is equal to its mana cost. You may plot non-land cards from the top of your library. It, it's basically future sight. Um, it kind of is, isn't it? The the biggest difference is if this if you hit lands, you don't get to play them off the top of your deck. Right. So this gets stalled out every time there's a land on top. But I mean as long as you're willing to wait an extra turn, you get you get free cards out of this. I'm willing a to. A three mana one one is not super exciting, mm -hmm. but it has word two, so it's kind of hard to kill. I'm just trying to think of how this will play out. I mean, it feels you like do... it'll play out like a mini future side in the sense that it is an enchantment effectively in play that's just a yeah, lot really easier to kill. Block. Right. The, it's never really good, you know, but it's just way easier to get rid of than an enchantment, even with ward two. Um. But I have to, I have to imagine that anytime, like if you get to untap with this thing, it's going to be scary for your opponent. Like you can start just plotting stuff off the top of your library. You know, anytime you don't have a land and you have the mana, you just do that and you're going to get ahead until they finally kill Fibblethip. I, I yeah, don't you, think that your opponent can let you just untap with it. If they have the option to kill it, they kind of have to. I think the biggest drawback is you spend three mana to not affect the board. And then on your next turn, you spend more mana to also not affect the board. True. So true. If it, you can't cast this turn three on the draw that often and expect the game to go well, that's true. So I do think it's a powerful card, and I agree with you. If my opponent has this in play, I'm looking for ways to kill it because otherwise, like, what are you trying to do? Mm -hmm. But there's going to be plenty of games, especially at double blue, where maybe this card fits in too awkwardly. So agree. I think this is probably closer to a C than a B. I would. I would I actually just give Pebble Thip a C. I would like, too. Look, this isn't more of a feast or famine card. There's cards where you play this, they don't kill, or games where you play this, they don't kill it, and you play three cards off it and it crushed them. Mm -hmm. And then there's games where you either can't play this or you have to play it and jump or you can't afford to plot a card because you're just going to die, so you have to cast a card from your hand. And like th those are the games where, you know, Fibble Thip, I think, loses a lot of value. So I would give a C for Thibble, Fibble Thip. It de definitely has a dream associated with it, but it's not it's not a bomb. Unlike it, it will be more situational than it seems. Yeah. yeah. What about Giralf the flesh, right? This is two and a blue for a legendary human warlock. So it is an outlaw a mythic rare. It's a two, three. And it says, whenever you cast a spell during your turn, other than the first spell that turn, create a two, two blue and black zombie rogue. And whenever a zombie enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on it for each other zombie that enter the battlefield under your control this turn. So, on the first spell, you get nothing. On the second mm. spell, you get a 2-2. Two, two. On the third spell, you get a 2-2 two, two that now gets a plus one, plus one counter from the previous one, and so you get a 3-3. Three, three. And then on the next one, you get a 4-4. Four, four. Wow. But mostly it's turn three, plot something, or even better yet, turn two, plot something. Like Maybe just turn two, plot the Tormenting Voice. Yeah, let's turn just three, do it. Turn three, the Flesh Right, cast the Tormenting Voice, make a 2-2. Two, two. Great. Yep. I just found the plotting stuff to work really well, so I would have probably given this an A before seeing this. But I, I definitely will will say that an A sounds right after having played with the plot cards. Okay. And you can also just on turn five, cast this plus a two drop and make a two, two. And that's already just fine. Yeah. One zombie from this and you've kind of gotten your money back and then two two or more, you're, you're really starting to get in there. So I like Geralt the Flesh Right at A. Just make sure you can play a deck that can play multiple spells in a turn. Also cool to try to set up like a stupid turn, right? Where you unplot three things or something, right? And just go bang, 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 bang. And all of a sudden you have this huge army. That's a way that you could justify plotting some things using your life total as a resource and then being like, boom, you know, I got a four, four, a three, three, a two, two, and a two, three, all of this turn plus the, the stuff that I plotted, you know, that'll get you right back in the game. Uh, what about double down? It says three in a blue. It's a enchantment at mythic rare. And it says whenever you cast an outlaw spell, copy that spell. So straight up in the build around category, you know, you, you have to be pretty confident that you're going to be 
playing a bunch of outlaws. But honestly, if you play this and then play a four drop outlaw, you, you've already kind of gotten, yeah. you know, great, not, not great value, but you've gotten your money back. It's kind of like you plotted. You took turn four off and then turn five, you got, you know, yeah. a four yeah. or five mana card doubled. Where it gets really, really spicy is the second and third one. You're just all of a sudden massively far ahead. Yeah. I actually think this one, this one will work out well in the right deck. So, I do too. I think it's a build around A minus or A or something, right? Like yeah, if you I would say build really around A minus. Yeah, you have to commit though. I mean, you want to have, you know, basically all your creatures should be uh, outlaws. As many as you can possibly put in. But these type of cards do actually work. Like if you get double down down, yes, it is a big cost of spend four mana to do nothing. But as you said, you can actually reestablish position and then take over quite quickly, assuming that you can effectively always cast an outlaw the turn after you cast double down. It doesn't yeah, take much either. Even like a two mana one will do, you know. Yeah, and and I think that if you take a turn off to play this and then play two outlaws in a row, you're already uh, you, you, back, you're gonna win back up game. back on board and even ahead, and yes. you'll end up pretty happy with this. So I would give it a build around A minus. Yeah, I Seems like, like it. a strong and cool card. I like cards like this existing. Me too. See, th this is like I like cards like that, and it's not asking that much. So many of the cards in the set meet the criteria that it's like, okay, I can do this. Uh, next is Stoic Sphinx. This is two blue blue for a 5-3 flash flying Sphinx at rare. And it has hexproof as long as you haven't cast a spell this turn. Oh, that's annoying. <laughs> that's so annoying. This card's awesome. I, I got to play with and against this card and it is exactly as good as, good as it looks. It's an A. You just get to sl slam this down. If they don't kill it in that one window, you mm -hmm. get to next turn. What, what will usually happens is you play this at the end of their turn. They, you know, when they played a creature or whatever, you smash them for five, play another thing. And then on their turn, it's just text proof again. And then if they leave mana up, you just don't play a spell on your turn. If you can avoid it and just you smash know, them again and you just keep smashing them. So yeah, the, the card is just absolutely ridiculous. And, and at five power in the air, it is big enough for you to say, you know what? I'm just not going to cast any spells. Like you have to put out something that can get in the way of this because it'll kill you in three turns, right? Like, the game's going to end. And and once you do cast something, well, now your mana's down and I can cast something to get it out of the way and smash you again. And then by the time it's your turn again, hey, look, hexproof, right? Like that's, this card's play patterns are perfect. Like exactly what you'd want. A for Stoic Sphinx. Last blue card is Step Between Worlds. This is three blue blue for a sorcery at rare. It says each player may shuffle their hand and graveyard into their library. Each player who does draw seven cards and you exile Step Between Worlds, and it has plot for four blue blue. So six mana plot for a time spiral. Yeah, I don't think this card is is, is feasible. Like, you're going to spend six mana and do nothing, and then next turn both yeah. players get to draw seven. Like, you, yes, you're, you're look, you're the first one to to get crack at that with all the mana untapped. If you've plotted, but you still. Yeah. But you still play, and I'm assuming you're just not casting it for five very often. Right. You're still not really getting that huge of an advantage, and you had to put this card in your deck that is such a brick most of the time. Yeah, how would you be able to, how would it be so much better that you're the first one to get to have the crack at it? Like, in limited, it's hard to imagine that that gives you access to winning the game. It does yeah. take away the downside of, I spend mana, reload my hand, pass to you with a reloaded hand and all of your mana. So it does even things back out again. And the card part doesn't matter because both players get seven again. That's pretty interesting. But as you said, you still have to pay the extreme tempo cost of six mana go and your opponent doesn't. So <clears throat> I'm with you. I, I feel like step between worlds is interesting, but ultimately it's going to play probably as an F or a, a D maybe some build around weirdness or something, but you just don't have the tools to punish your opponent in one turn cycle where you can like put away the game like you do in older formats where that can actually happen. Yeah. Gold cards. <clears throat> Gold cards. Bunch of them. First one up is Assimilation Aegis. This is one blue white for an artifact equipment at Mythic Rare. And it says, uh, when it enters the battlefield, exile up to one target creature until uh, Assimilation Aegis leaves the battlefield. 
wow, so that's already sweet. And it says, um, when assimilation agis becomes attached to a creature for as long as it remains attached to it, that creature becomes a copy of a creature card exiled with assimilation agis. And the equip cost is actually fairly low at two. But we've got a very clear baseline here, right? That this is like an oblivion ring type effect and then you get some extra random upside. It's basically a blue white oblivion ring with the upside of you get to spend two to like turn one of your creatures into that creature. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get any ETBs, but I don't know if you have oblivion ring like a flyer or something like that. It, you know, you get to turn your, your worst creature into it and you are going to cast this on a, a good card most of the time. Yeah, whatever their best creature is that you can hit with it at the time is what you're going to get. So whatever. But I mean, I'll take that. That's interesting, cool design, reasonably costed upside that isn't like you could just take all that away and still play this card uh, in limited reliably. That's a neat design to me. Uh, what do you want to give it? Like the tricky part, of course. So an Oblivion Ring you know, sorcery speed, it's an artifact in this case, three mana to take out something that usually plays in somewhere like the B minus to B range. But this one does have an upside. Yeah, I think the upside's pretty real. Like, so I, like I don't a think solid B. I would just give it a B. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a gold oblivion ring that, you know, sometimes you're you're gonna, you're gonna copy some get to copy something pretty effective. Like yeah. I, I could see that being being pretty sweet. Like you said, and putting it on your worst creature, that's pretty cool. Um, limits the risk a little bit. Next is Satoru, Satoru the Infiltrator. This is blue, black for a 2-3 legendary human ninja rogue at rare. It's got menace. And it says when it and or uh, one or more other non-token creatures enters the battlefield under your control, if one of them were cast or no mana was spent to cast them, draw a card. <laughs> what? Basically, every time you plot a creature, okay. uh, you draw a card. Okay. And so it's Thank a two you. mana, two, three menace by itself, which hmm. you would put in your deck. Like sure. you, you would always play that. And it's a rogue. And, yeah. And then when, whenever you plot a creature, or if you like blinked a creature or something like that, or if you raised dead at a creature, um, then you get to draw a card. So... It's, it sounds like pretty str st strong upside to me. And it counts itself, even though it doesn't have plot. Yeah, if you plotted this with Jace or okay. or if you cast one of the, the, the black spells that puts directly into play from your graveyard, you would draw a card. It would just, so, it just says like, don't leave me out. Okay, fair enough. All the plot stuff's pretty good too. Like you're going to put Lone Shark in your blue black deck and be happy mm -hmm. with it. So, mm -hmm. I, I, or same with the Jin. I would give Satoru a B. It's just good in any blue black deck. Yeah. And it, and if you have a ton of plot, sure, it goes up to like a B plus or a minus even if you're like really doing it. But two minute, two, three minutes that might draw you a card at some point. It's a card I'm really happy to play. All right. B for uh, Satoru, the infiltrator. Next is laughing Jasper Flint. <laughs> He's laughing all the way to the bank. This guy's a one black red for a four, three legendary lizard rogue at rare. It says creatures you control but don't own are mercenaries in addition to their other types, which the next part will explain what that means. Uh, at the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top X cards of target opponent's library or X the number of outlaws you control. And until end of turn, you can cast spells from those cards so you can't play lands. And mana of any type can be spent to cast those spells. The thing is, he self-fuels. So when you play Laughing Jasper Flint on turn three, even with nothing else in play on your upkeep, you're going to exile their top card and you can cast it if it's a spell. And then every every one of their creatures you cast is an outlaw. Plus, you could just play other outlaws from your deck. Uh huh. This just draws you a card every turn. And in the late game, you can even threaten to deck your opponent. Really? I mean, imagine you have four outlaws in play. They're going to, the top four cards of their deck are getting exiled. Really, the only reason you wouldn't deck your opponent is that they're going to get overwhelmed by the number of spells you're playing before that even happens. Right. And also, by the way, it's a freaking three mana four three. <laughs> yeah, like it, like it's a red black three mana four three. Like that thing smashes very very hard with no help at all. That's a great card. Yeah, laughing Jasper Flint is just awesome. So I, I would give I would give this an A minus. Like yeah, you weren't you kidding. This card. He is laughing all the way to the bank. Yeah, it really is. It's a three mana fourth that draws a card every turn and starts to mill them and then starts to draw more cards the, the more things you play. Like, 
You're not really, there's, there's no, there's no fail cases here. You know, you'd laugh too. Uh, next is a cool, the unrepentant. This is wow. Black, black, red, red, tough mana cost. What do you get for it? A legendary scorpion dragon rogue at regular rare. It's a five, five flying trample. And it says you can sacrifice three other creatures you may put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. You can only do it sorcery speed and only once each turn. So I would just ignore that middle part and really focus on, can I cast black, black, red, red for my pretty awesome 5-5 five, five flame trampler? How hard is that if I have a 9-8 mana base? What turn am I casting a cool, the unrepentant? Probably like turn mana six base? a lot of the time. Six-ish. But- but Pretty I mean, good. You, you can also play nine nine, you know, or you can mm. play eight eight and and two duels if you can if you can okay. get a couple duels. There there are some duels in the format, you know. Yeah. I I, th- I think that uh, a cool is a pretty strong card. Like the ability does nothing. The sack three creatures ability. You're basically never going to use that ability, right. and that that is totally fine. Like it's still just a really strong card. Yeah. So it's just a mana cost thing. You need to be split roughly down the middle. You know, you don't want a ten seven here, but. I mean, I'll take a 5-5 five, five Flying Trample on turn six. Yeah. That's fine by me. Um, B plus for a cool? I'll get B plus for a cool. Just still a lot of power toughness. It's just stats, but it's a lot of them. Next is Rakdos. Rakdos joins up. This is three black red for a legendary enchantment. It's rare, and it says, when enters the battlefield, return tar- creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield with two additional plus one plus one counters on it. And whenever a legendary creature you control dies, Rakdos joined up deals damage equal to that creature's power to target opponent. It's okay. It's, it's a zombify that Hmm. every now and like gives two plus one plus one encounters on the, on the outset. And then if one of your legends dies, maybe you nug your opponent for four or something. Yeah. How much, how much is the zombify effect, you know, getting a creature back from your yard to the battlefield? How much is it about, having a target at all versus getting a good target because this does you know upgrade say your three drop into a five-ish mana spell with the two plus one plus one counters right yeah i mean you're, you're getting your mana's worth for this card mm-hmm. like you you are getting you know you, do you remember the uh the card that was a uh, defossilize or whatever where you mm. the creature explores twice yeah like this is a little worse than that. I think two plus one plus one counters are a bit worse than exploring twice, mm-hmm. but it's still like a pretty good amount of extra value. And there's like kind of a lot of legends in the set. There are. So it's not a, it's not a zero percenter that that part matters too. Okay. And it's also in the perfect color pair for this that has, you know, usually the two types of removal that are a, the best and B put creatures into the yard, right? Oh, this is only yours. Oh, yeah, it's, it's only, only yours. If it was yard. theirs, I'd be really into this. But yeah. I, I think I think it's just a kind of a medium card here. Okay. Like, if you have some good creatures, it can be decent. If you have good ETBs, it can be nice. I would say this is kind of like a C-level card, but C, you can C get plus. to a B if you have a lot of really good creatures, if you can uh, if you can kind of, roll, like, have some self-mill going on. Like, you can splash colors in this format to some degree. And, like, imagine a, a green-black-red deck that's, like, got the green-black self-mill theme and then just ha- wants to play this card. Yeah. Also, if you bring back a legend with this, it's pretty good. It is pretty like, good. You you bring back like a, you know, some kind of like, let's say you brought back Laughing Jasper Flint, just to use the example of a card we just saw. It'd come back as a 6-5 when they kill it. They take six. Like, that's yeah. not weak. Yeah. C, C plus for Rakdos joins up. The two plus one plus one counters goes a long way there. Next is Rakdos the Muscle. This is two black, black, red for a 6-5 flying trample legendary demon mercenary at mythic rare and it says whenever you sacrifice another creature exile cards equal to the mana value to its mana value from the top of target players library until your next end step you may play those cards and mana of any type can be spent to cast those spells and then it also has the activated ability sacrifice another creature rakdos the muscle gains indestructible until end of turn tap it and you can only do it once each turn good lord I mean, this card is just, just absolutely un- obscene. Stoppable. So let's talk about it in parts. First of all, it's five mana for a six-five flying trample G-G. that costs about the same in terms of difficulty as a cool to unrepentant. Probably, mm-hmm. you know, instead of the second red, you have to pay. Uh, you have to pay two two colorless. Right. And then it also has sack a creature to make it indestructible. So your so opponent it's unkillable. <laughs> 
has a hard time killing it. And when you do sack that creature, first of all, you mill them for a bunch. Yeah. And you can play as many of those spells as you have the, the mana type. And it's until your next end step. So on their turn, it's until your uh, the whole next turn. On your turn, you, you have that turn to play it. But it's still, like, this card does a lot. I mean, you could spend any type of mana to cast them, and you can play lands. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just, this is kind of one of those ones that does everything you want it to do. Yeah, that's, I mean, assuming black red's playable, that's a front runner for best card in the set right there as well. Yeah, it, very strong. I mean, it, it has all the characteristics you want out of a bomb. It's gigantic. Yes. Not the most expensive. Five mana is not crazy. Really hard to kill. And it has this massively powerful ability if if your opponent doesn't stop you from doing it. Yeah. I like A plus for Rakdos, the muscle. Yeah, I would um, give it A plus as well. Next is Roxanne Starfell Savant. This is three red green for a 4-3 legendary cat druid at rare. And whenever Roxanne enters the battlefield or attacks, create a tapped colorless artifact token named Meteorite with when Meteorite enters the battlefield, it deals two damage to any target and tap add one mana of any color. And whenever you tap an artifact token for mana, oh geez, that's a little on the nose, uh, add one <laughs> mana of any type that artifact token produced. So it doubles it as well. It, it doubles the meteorites ability. Is it, that what it yeah, does? Yeah, it makes them into tapping for two instead of one. Um, Good but, lord! I mean, remember when you, we used to cast meteorite? Instead, you cast that meteorite, but you also mana. get a four three, <laughs> and you also get to do it every time she attacks. I mean, <laughs> I mean, meteorite uh, was the same, you know, mana cost. It, it was five mana. To, to be fair, Meteorite was not a very good card. But That's still. true. <laughs> so, and only uh, an Rock, uncommon or whatever. But Roxanne on. looks awesome. I mean, imagine you're, you're, you play your four drop, and then on their turn five, they go, play this, kill your card that you played on turn two. Now I have a double mana rock, so I'll untap with like seven or eight mana. And when she attacks, she gets to nug something else for two also. And make That's, another Meteorite. And, and make leave another Meteorite. And the only little snag is that they ETB tap, so you can't just like, you know, chain them together or something, but... Wow. Um, I guess I would give Roxanne an A. Yeah, I would give I her mean, an A as well. F f five mana, four, three, deal two would already be like excellent, you know, in the A range. So yeah, and this is better than that. So A for Roxanne. Next is Seraphic Steed. It's green, white for a two, two unicorn mount at rare. It's got first strike and lifelink. So two mana, two, two, first strike, lifelink. Pretty good. And whenever it attacks while saddled, you get a 3-3 three, three white angel creature token with flying. You just get one? Yeah. This card is absurd. Like, Saddle two mana, two, four. two, first strike lifelink would be a B. Like, mm -hmm. you're just like, okay, great. That's just such a brawler. It uses combat tricks really well, all yeah. that stuff. <laughs> and then you add to that <laughs> the, the fact that when you saddle it, all of a sudden you're attacking, you get a 3-3? Three, three? Flying. Like, what is going on here? <laughs> It, saddle is four, so it is a lot, but like you're just going to pay that any time you can. And as you mentioned, this thing is like a canvas on which to paint plus one, plus one counters or combat tricks or whatever. I Like imagine you're over there sitting with like a three, three or something and they're just like attack with traffic, you know, saddle it up with the rest of my board attack with this, make a 3-3, three, three, and you're just staring at it like, I guess I block, and you're just going to gain a bunch of life and use some stupid combat trick. Wow. Yeah, what are you going to do, not block? Like, Right, exactly. <laughs> and if you, if, you, if you end up in a situation where you don't have a trick or, or it's, not a, it's not a good attack, sometimes you just cash this in and get a 3-3 three, three out of it. Like Definitely. you saddle it, attack, gain two life, and get a 3-3. Three, three. And that's like the low end case in a lot of ways. There's just no way this card fails because a two mana, two, two, first strike lifelink is already good. And then when you can saddle it, when you do have a combat trick, that kind of thing, like you're, you're going to, you're going to find those games to be particularly easy to win. Yeah. I think the only, you know, the use case where this card is vulnerable, which is a very common one is that you run it out and they kill it, right? Like it is, it does not do anything to prevent any of that. They, they, it's only two toughness and they can definitely use whatever removal spell is castable to kill your, your steed. And that will happen some percentage of the time. That's not a knock on the card. Like, doesn't mean that the card's bad or anything. In fact, it's a compliment to the card. But that will play out that way if you run out your steed on turn two. Um, you know, 
routinely you'll often see your opponent go land number three, use the removal spell I have in my hand to kill your steed. And that's that's fine. That is what it is. But, uh, you know, this card scales well later into the game. In fact, you could argue it's even better later in the game than it is early. And of course, if you have any way to protect it, I would definitely try to set that up, you know, uh, wait until I could cast my protection spell to, to kill it. Because I mean, you get to just keep adding three, three flyers to your board. Like you're not actually falling behind by paying the saddle cost. If you get one attack in where it makes a flyer and this thing survives, you're so far you're ahead of the game. So far ahead. So, uh, what do you want to give the steed? Like a B plus? A minus? A minus? Okay. Yeah, it's right in that Super range. Super threatening card. I mean, Definitely. you're probably not going to saddle it on turn three all that often, but there are a bunch of four twos for three. There's like, mm -hmm. they're, they're in multiple colors, and including that's a, green. That's a slammer. I mean, that's game over. That's just game over, right? If, if Assuming it has a good attack, at the end of turn three, you have a two two, a three three, and a four two. <laughs> like, what, what are they doing? Like, <laughs> yeah, they're just, they're, they're done. So, right. Okay, A minus think, for Seraphic Steed. I think A minus is good for, for Seraphic Steed, which leads us into Wily Duke. So not Wily as in Wily Coyote, just the name Wily. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if, if any relation to Reed or not. It's, it's okay. not made clear by the flavor text. Okay. Uh, Atten Hero, it's one green white for a 4-2 legendary human ranger at rare, so not an outlaw. Has Vigilance, and whenever it becomes tapped, you gain a life and draw a card. So the joke here is Mounts, you can saddle up creatures. That's the way to tap it. Otherwise, it doesn't naturally have a way to tap. Mm. So this is a build around. It's it's like a build around B+. If you've got this in a green-white deck that has three mounts, sometimes you cast this, you're going to immediately draw a card, and then your opponent, is the burden's on them to either kill this or kill the mount, probably this. But you already got your card back. You got your life, everything. And then if you cast it and you don't draw a mount, it's a three-mana 4-2 Vigilance, which isn't that exciting. So it's, it's basically not a great card unless you can kind of make it do the thing so you want three to four mounts if you can more, more is better yeah but then it becomes a fantastic card i wish i wish that the, it was riding the the seraphic steed it, it's riding a white horse but it's not a unicorn <laughs> it's that's just true. like the steed, this is if you want those two rares in succession of course the game's over <laughs> that's the combo for sure running up the score there yeah uh, i would give this a build around b to B yeah. plus for Wiley Duke in a regular deck, I guess you could include it, but like you said, it's actually pretty unexciting there. Um, Selvala eager trailblazers next is two green white for a four, five legendary elf scout at mythic rare with vigilance four mana, four, five vigilance. Whenever you cast a creature spell, create a one, one mercenary token with the pump ability and you can tap it and choose a color. Add one mana of that color for each different power among creatures you control. Wow, that is awesome. I mean, four mana, four or five vigilance that taps for probably two or three mana. Great. Add to that that whenever you cast a creature, you get a mercenary, which also because the mercenary is not only a one one but taps to get plus one plus zero. It's so easy to have to end up with like four different powers in play. Yeah. You're like, I've got I've got this a mercenary and two two twos. All right, I'll tap make one of the two twos a three two. Tap this for four mana. Right. And it's got vigilance, so you could attack first and then just dump stuff on the battlefield. And then it is green white, so creature, you know, creatures are going to be prevalent there. And you just get to spit out a bunch of one ones every time you do this. Th that isn't limited to one per turn either, right? It's just cast a creature, get a one one. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you just get a one on every time. You, and she could, like, you're going to play her and then next turn double a creature a lot of the time. Definitely. That looks like an A to me. It's an A. I really like five toughness here too, because it makes it really difficult to kill. Uh, next is Combal Profiteering Mayor. This is one black white for a two, four legendary human advisor at rare. It says whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your opponent's control, for each of them create a tap token that's a copy of it. This ability triggers only once each turn. And whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses a life and you gain a life. So, is the joke here like that that second line of text is kind of the one you should focus on because you're going to be making your own tokens and triggering it. But then if your opponent ever tries to do anything, you get a copy and a trigger off of it as well. Yep. It, basically, it's a it's not a three minute two four. First of all, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, it, it holds the ground well. I would play this in any deck that has a couple ways to make tokens. It doesn't have to be a focus of the deck because I feel like your opponents make tokens at a pretty high rate just in general in Magic these days. Like every color has some amount of, of ways to do this. And then if you if you get like 
ever get a free token off them, this card is like puts you miles ahead. And mm -hmm. when you're draining your opponent, when you make a token, like that's pretty neat. It, it's a good card. So, it, so you good. build around it and make tokens. That's the thing. Like, is that hard? That sounds difficult. Well, what I'm saying is you don't have to do that. You you can play this in a deck that makes maybe a token or two here and there. Okay. Just because it's a three mana two four that makes it so it really punishes your opponent for making tokens. Okay. Like, I, your average deck has ways to make tokens in it. I would say more more often than not, whether it's a random treasure, whether it's you know a Definitely. clue, whether it's a creature token, mercenary tokens are all over. You don't have to get much to make this good. So I would I would main deck this. I think I'd probably main deck this if I had no ways to make tokens. Okay. And what would you give it if, like, give me two grades, give me a, I've built around this. I can make a decent number of tokens and versus I'm not really token focused. It's right a C now. plus. If you, you assume you're never going to do it by yourself. And it's like, I would say like a B if you can reliably get two or three drains off. Okay. Um, Malcolm, the eyes, this is blue red for a two, two flying haste. It's a legendary siren pirate <coughs> pirate at rare. And it says, whenever you cast your second spell each turn, investigate. So you get a clue token. That's cool. This card's amazing. Two mana, two, two flying haste that generates clues. And then those clues draw you cards, which means that you're going to be able to trigger it other times. I found it trivial to, to, to cast two spells in a turn. What's, it, what especially with, with the fact that this is two mana only. So that, like it comes at the point of the curve where you are going to play this then play right. something else. Yeah. Right. I mean, Here's where I, how I see this playing out in your opening hand. Turn two, you play this, hit them for two. Next turn, you hit them for two and plot a card. Next turn, you play two spells and get a clue. At that point, you're 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 very you're very happy. And this thing's clocking pretty hard too. I mean, yeah, two two flying. I mean, yeah. I play a two two flying haze for two. So getting yes. free clues out of the deal is great. I, I would give Malcolm an A minus. Like, oh okay, it's a it's a cheap aggressive card that your opponent kind of feels obliged to deal with. I, I don't think you get much more for two mana. No, in the not late game on turn, you know, six or seven, casting this and casting a spell is also really easy. Definitely, I agree. Uh, you, you're getting way way more than your two mana worth. So A minus for Malcolm. Next is breaches the blast maker. This is one red blue for a three three legendary creature. Goblin Pirate at rare. It's got Menace. So three mana, three, three Menace. And whenever you cast your second spell each turn, you may sacrifice an artifact. If you do, flip a coin. When you win the flip, copy that spell. When You ch uh, you may choose new targets for the copy. When you lose the flip, breaches the uh, Blast Maker deals damage equal to that spell's mana value to any target. So... Don't be confused with uh, Kark. Kark has a similar mm -hmm. vibe where when you when you lose the flip here, your spell is not countered. You still get your spell. You just get a little lightning bolt instead of a copy. It so might it's, it's, be better. <laughs> it will be better some of the time for yeah. sure. Zero mana lightning bolt's better than a, whatever the spell you played. Like you know, assuming you played like a three mana spell, for example. So this is upside and upside. What's difficult is you have to cast your second spell. And you have to have an artifact and play to sacrifice. Yeah, that's tough. It, having the artifact is a little bit trickier. It's not like there's a really, f you know, free source of artifacts running around here. Right. You you want to have a random treasure or you may have actually had to cast it from your hand. So yeah. setup cost is relatively high to pop off. You are getting a three mana, three, three menace just straight up, which is already totally fine. And then maybe you set this up. Setup cost is high, though. You need to have an artifact that you're willing to sack, and you need to cast two spells in one turn. <clears throat> Would you go, like, B for Breach as the Blast Maker? Yeah. I mean, a 3-mana, three 3-3 three, three Menace is pretty it's good. Totally and, fine, yeah. And then if you if you can if you can get something going, it's decent. I think you're not going to have the thing work very often, so it's probably like a B-minus is my guess. Okay, B, B-minus for Breaches. Next is Lila Undefeated Slickshot. Uh-oh, there's the word. Uh, <laughs> one blue red for a three, three legendary human rogue at rare with prowess, which if you've never played with prowess, it's whenever you cast non-creature spell, this thing gets plus one plus one until end of turn. So it says whenever you cast a multicolored instant or sorcery spell from your hand, exile that s spell instead of putting it into your graveyard as it resolves. If you do, it becomes plotted, but it still happens, right? Oh yeah. Oh, Nice. So three mana, three, three prowess is pretty solid, especially mm -hmm. in blue red. This is going to get some decent action there. Yep. And then you're not casting a multicolored instant or sorcery very often. There is the, right. the you know, the, the, the 
the slick sequence card, yeah. the blue red shock that draws you a card, that's like yeah. going to be your best bet. But if you get one trigger out of this, it's like a B plus. If you get zero triggers in a game, it's like a B minus. So I would just give Lila a B and just try to find, I mean, if you cast the blue green draw three, the make your own luck card, like with this, like that, we're really talking there. <laughs> Definitely. That's sweet. Yeah. So good upside on a pretty decent body. I mean, this thing will hit for four or five, like often it's very difficult to block as well. Uh, next is Pillage the Bog. This is black green for a sorcery at rare. Look at the top X cards of your library, where X is twice the number of lands you control. Put one of them in your hand and the rest in the bottom of your library in a random order, but you can plot this for one green black. I normally am not that big on like impulse type effects, but I actually think this one's pretty good because on turn two, you get to look at your top four. Mm -hmm. And if you have nothing else to do on turn two, that will increase your card quality. It finds you your third land. It finds you a four drop if you, you know, have that spot open on the curve, that sort mm -hmm. of things. And there's no um, restriction on the card, right? You can just take the no, one you want. Okay. They don't, they don't even get to look at any of those things, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then if you have time to plot it, it can set up a double spell thing, which in green black isn't like a huge bonus, but uh -huh. it's, it's, it's not nothing. And then in the late game, it's demonic tutor. Like if yeah. you plotted this card and then just on turn five cast it, you look at the top yeah. 10 cards, you'll just yeah. find whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. I think Pillage of the Bog is a B. I just do think it's going to find the card you need at a high rate. And at two, it's got some good ways to cast it. Cast it on turn two if you got nothing going on. Plot it on turn three if you don't need something immediately. Or just like try to set up a plot of casting it later. I don't know. There's a lot yeah. of ways to kind of kind of go about this. I wish it was a little more synergistic. It's just kind of a, a power level card, but it's good. I agree with you. Uh, next is Vraska joins up. This is same cost, uh, green black for a legendary enchantment at rare. When it enters the battlefield, put a death touch counter on each creature you control. Okay, so not a turn two play, at least from that perspective. And then the next thing says, whenever a legendary creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. How much yeah. do we care about death death touch counters? I don't think on death each touching creature? your team is really worth a card most of the time. Yeah, I like, agree. Like you have to have like three creatures in play and probably one of those creatures doesn't care about death touch. So like, what do you even, you know, yeah. giving a four, four death touch is not that impressive. No. So yes, there's a lot of legendary creatures in the set, but I, I, I'm pretty skeptical on all the like joins the team cards and yeah. this one's no exception. This looks like a D to me. Yeah. D or maybe an F for Vraska joins up next is Vraska herself. Vraska, the silencer. This is one green black for a three, three legendary Gorgon assassin at Mythic Rare with Death Touch. And whenever a non-token creature an opponent controls dies, you may pay one. If you do, return that card to the battlefield tapped under your control. It's a treasure artifact with tap, sacrifice, this artifact, add one mana of any color, and it loses all other card types. <laughs> so it just turns them into treasures. That's what that does. Yeah. So you don't, you don't get anything out of them is being that, a creature except... Oh, I mean, getting a treasure at whenever, whenever one of their creatures dies is pretty nice. You have to pay one, which really right. does limit it. But like getting a treasure, I mean, if 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 they had a bunch of creature die, of their creatures dies, you can, uh, you can like pay one to get one and then sack that to to get another one. But I guess they go back to the graveyard. So it doesn't really even do anything. It doesn't right. exile them. But right. really, just. It's a three mana, three, three death touch that you might get a treasure or two out of. Like, that's fine. That's it's like fine. a B plus. It's like a B. Yeah, B plus maybe for Vraska the Silencer. I got to say, I was hoping for a little more. Uh, but maybe I'll get it from the Gitrog Ravenous Ride. This is three black green for a six, five trample haste legendary oh, yeah. frog horror mount at Mythic Rare. Saddle is one. And it says whenever it deals combat damage to a player you may sacrifice a creature that saddled it this turn. If you do draw X cards and put up to X lands from your hand onto the battlefield tapped where X is a sacrifice creature's power. So this one does seem to be leaning on stats more than anything, but that ability could be relevant, but it's a five mana, six, five trample haste. I mean, that is a slammer. That's a charging monster sword if I've ever seen one, right? No and doubt. And you're going to get to 
combat damage through most of the time. So mm -hmm. saddling this with like a 3-3 three, three sounds pretty good. Sack a 3-3 three, three to draw three cards, and you get to even put lands into into play. So like you're not you're not getting that far behind, even though mm -hmm. you kind of are spending your turn to put a tap creature into play and tapping another creature so that you're going to open up a counterattack. But 5-mana 6-5 Trample Haste that lets you throw away creatures to draw a bunch of cards. I mean, yep. it's upside after upside here. This looks like an A to me. It looks like, like an you're A. Just gonna, you're going to put this card in your deck. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna win a lot of games with it. Extremely high floor with upside. Next is Ty Joaquin, Perfect Shot. This is a black, uh, excuse me, red-white for a 2-3 legendary human mercenary at rare. It says, whenever a source you control deals non-combat damage to a creature equal to that creature's toughness, draw a card, and you can pay X and tap it, to, and it says, if a source you control would deal non-combat combat damage to a permanent or player this turn, it deals that much damage plus X instead. So it lets you kind of make up the difference between your shock and a four toughness creature or something. Yeah, it it basically, you have to hold priority if you're casting a shock, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so that that's going to... But it'll get you the card. Yeah, but it'll get you the card pretty easily. And it's a two mana, two, three. So I think... Uh, that's I think fine. it's pretty solid. I, I just hate, I just, whenever a card says whenever a non-combat source, it's like, yeah, okay. It just doesn't happen that often, right? Like how many burn spells does the average red white deck have in it? Like one or two, right? Yeah. So that, all that text, all that complexity, all that interesting stuff is kind of like, yeah, but it doesn't happen really. Or if it does, it's like, okay, I did it. I, I comboed off, right? They had a, two, three, and I used a shock plus X plus tap this to kill it and draw myself a card. It's like, all right, you did it. That said, it is still a two, three for two. And this is all upside you. And you might have a deck that have five burn spells in it somehow, and they might line up perfectly with your opponent's, you know, creature, or you might have enough mana left over to make Ty Joaquin line it up. It's just a lot of finickiness for not like an amazing payoff and kind of a weird design, right? It's like, I don't think I've ever heard it say it, you get a big bonus for having to deal exactly the right amount of damage, you know, the perfect shot as it were. Um, I would say C plus for Ty Joaquin. Yeah, I think C plus is about right. And if you pick up this card, it's like somewhat early, you, you can build around it. A little bit, like, a little bit. I mean, it just it just bumps the burn spells up in your pick order. And, yeah, it does. And and I think that that is fine. Like it's it, you're not paying much of a cost. A two mana two three is just slightly above the curve, Definitely. just stats wise. And if if your burn spells basically all say draw a card on them, like that's pretty good. If that were the case, yes, yes. Um. Next is Bruce Tarl, Roving Rancher. This is two red white for a 4 3 legendary human warrior at rare. It says oxen you control have double strike. And whenever Bruce enters the battlefield uh, or attacks, exile the top card of your library. If it's a land card, create a 2 2 white ox creature token. Otherwise, you may cast it until the end of your next turn. And you do have to pay for that. Fantastic card. I mean, that's sweet. You cast this on four, you're hoping to exile a land because you get a 2-2 two, two double striker. Yeah. And then on your next turn, if you can attack with this, which you usually can, it's a 4-3, you get an, another bite. And there, sometimes you want the land, sometimes you want a spell. kind of depends what you, you're going on that turn. Mm -hmm. But it just gets you good value no matter what and it get, does so immediately. Like, the, the card is just great. I mean, so you're either getting 2-2 two, two double strikers or effectively drawing a card because it's until the end of your next turn. So, like, you have a long window to actually use those cards. And that's and you're getting the first one for free. Yeah, that's. I mean, great. This, this, this isn't a like it's that's just a great a. card. That's awesome. And even if they kill Bruce, you still get the two twos. They are not death the double strikers anymore, but it leaves behind yeah. an oxen army. Next is Oko, the ringleader. How many man hours went into uh, <laughs> designing Oko? Making sure Oko wasn't too much. Well, yeah. That, they are safe. It, it is, in fact, not too much. <laughs> uh, so it's two blue-green for a three-loyalty Oko Planeswalker at Mythic, and it has static ability at the beginning of combat on your turn. Oko becomes a copy of up to one target creature you control until end of turn, except it has hexproof. And then it's got a plus one, a minus one, and a minus five. So plus one, draw two cards. If you've committed a crime this turn, discard a card, otherwise discard two cards. 
Minus one is you get a three, three elk, a green elk creature token. And the ultimate at minus five is for each other non-land permanent you control, create a token that's a copy of that permanent. Cool. That's got yeah. a lot going on. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty solid card. Like it's, you know, four, even just like four mana, minus one, make an elk. Next turn, minus one, make an elk, like is pretty good. Uh, you can you can bash with Oko if you want. And then if you've committed a crime, you know, starting to draw two, discard one is pretty good too. Like there's just a lot going on here that's that's pretty solid. Yeah, I like this. And, and it feels like that static ability will be quite strong. Like you just copy your best thing. And yeah, sometimes you won't have a clean attack and you'll just have to sit back, but sometimes you get to slam. Yeah. I think that Oko looks like an A minus to me. If, me too. If you if you play a three drop, then they play a three drop, then you're like Oko make an elk. They they have to have two removal spells to kill Oko, and if they don't, they just you get to play it. You get to make another elk, and you just keep going. Like you're you're yeah. doing some pretty good stuff here. You're doing some really good stuff. Yeah. And if you told me that there was a four mana Oko with three loyalty, a plus one, a minus one, and a minus five, I would have guessed it would be even stronger than this. I'm kind of glad that they aimed a little bit lower. So uh, yeah, A minus for Oko, the ringleader. Next is Bonnie Paul Clearcutter. This is three green, blue, blue for a six, five legendary giant scout at rare. It's got reach. And when Bonnie enters the, uh, Bonnie enters the battlefield, create bow, a legendary blue ox creature token with this creature's power and toughness are each equal to the number of lands you control. And whenever you attack, draw a card, then you may put a land card from your hand or graveyard onto the battlefield. I mean, this is my this is my pick for best card in the set because for six mana, you get a six five reach plus a six six. <laughs> and one thing that you probably didn't notice is mm -hmm. that the third ability triggers whenever you attack with anything. What? I did not, not notice that. Oh Paul. my god. So, so you get it right so now. So you cast this, you get a six five and a six six, you attack with your two two, then draw a card and put a land into play. Or or from your graveyard even. <laughs> <laughs> like what are we talking about here this is this is paul bunyan is that what's happening that is unbelievable yeah how's how's the mana cost for you six mana with double blue and a green <clears throat> i mean that's just castable when you get to six mana well i've never seen a better card <laughs> i love it yeah PB, i think this card BB. is is absolutely wild how good it is Okay, so A plus, A? A plus for sure. Bonnie A plus. Next is Ariet, the Beguiler. This is one, okay, the mana costs start to get a little sketchy here. One white, blue, black. For a 4-4 four, four legendary human warlock at rare with lifelink. And it says whenever an aura you control becomes attached to a non-land permanent an opponent controls with a mana value less than or equal to that aura's mana value, gain control of that permanent for as long as the aura is attached to it. Really? This card's, an, this card's an F and I say that because there's no support for it. Like you should not, this is kind of like uh, you remember Dominary United a little bit mm -hmm. where there was yeah. a bunch of like build arounds at rare that didn't function mm -hmm. just cause yep. they, they wanted those cards in the set, I guess. Yeah. Uh, th that's what is going on here with area. It just doesn't work. Like there's just no, there's no real way to make it work. So it, sure. If, if you have the mana to play it, then sure. You can put this in your Esper deck. You know, you're playing five color deserts and the mana cost is not a huge burden. Then play your four mana, four, four lifelink, but the, it, it effectively has no other text. And you got to kind of remember that that's like a bit of a, a bit of a trap that you can't actually do those things. What would you give it grade wise? It would just as a four four lifelink for for one white blue black. I mean, I, like a D. That's like a D. Like okay. you you have to you have to be doing the thing pretty hard in order for that to work. Next is Marchesa Dealer of Death. This cost blue black red for a three four legendary human rogue at rare. Whenever you commit a crime, you may pay one. If you do, look at the top two cards of your library. Put one of them into your hand and the other into your graveyard. Wow. So let's start with the mana cost. Is this a castable card in the format? Is this a card that I can actually get onto the battlefield? I'm playing, you know, yeah. black, red, and I want to splash a blue. You, well, there's two ways. There's A, you're playing two of these and splashing the third off like 
a couple deserts, you know, or something mm-hmm. like that. You're, you're not playing green, so you don't have access to those. There are also some colorless cards that help with fixing. Mm-hmm. Or you're just playing like the five color desert deck, which I think is a, is a real deck too. Okay. So if that's the case, then I'm in. Because that's a nice ability. Commit a crime, just tack on one extra mana and start getting cards. Yeah. I mean, it, once you do this once, you'll probably find something else that will get you another card. You know, yeah. you're casting sleight of hand every time you commit a crime. Right. And pretty efficient cost. Three mana for a three, four, even though the mana cost obviously is a little bit difficult. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm in for Marchesa. She looks like a B plus to B+, me. B plus, yeah. Difficult to cast. That's the only thing. Next is Obeka, Splitter of Seconds. This is one blue, black, red for a 2-5 Menace. <laughs> it's a legendary Ogre Warlock at rare. And whenever Obeka deals uh, combat damage to a player, you get that many additional upkeep steps <laughs> after this phase? This is another F. There, there's there's not really... It, it's just for like constructed, well, commander more specifically, like you're not doing this thing. <laughs> so, so this is for cards to say at the beginning of your upkeep, you get something good. Yeah. And this thing, just for my own brain, those upkeep steps happen after the combat phase. Yes. You get a bunch of up, upkeep <laughs> okay, steps. Just afterwards. an F whatever. Uh, next yeah. is Gired mirror of the wilds. This is, uh, Red, green, white for a 3-3 legendary human shaman. This one's mythic rare, and it's got haste, and it says non-token creatures you control have tap, create a token that's a copy of target token you control that entered the battlefield this turn. Basically, all of your all of your, your creature tokens you can just you can just copy with this thing. Like all your cre- all your creatures can tap to 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 copy a creature token that that came in this turn. So what you're trying to do here is like make an XX elemental, right? With like the tumbleweeds card, like a five five, and then you get to copy it with two of your creatures and attack for a bunch. This is kind of like a build around C where like if you have a bunch of ways to copy things, then you mean a bunch of ways, bunch to, of ways make to make tokens? tokens, then you'll, you'll end up getting to copy a bunch of them while, while you're attacking and whatnot. I mean, it does, I mean, it seems good. like they just sit there, right? Like if I have three random creatures, this plus two others, and I play any token creature, I can just go copy it, attack copy it, the copy token it twice. Well, what do you mean yeah. attack? What am I attacking with? Oh, sorry. I read, I misread this as the token having haste and, and lasting until end of turn. Yeah, no, I think it just copies them. Oh, no, no, you're right. So this, yeah. this basically is a, is a pretty big payoff. So you just make yeah. a 5-5 five, five token. Even just making a mercenary and cat getting two copies of it is like kind of nice. Yeah, this thing plus your other two creatures, you, all of a sudden you have three copies. The, the, the trick is that you have to make token copies or token cards, right? Token creatures. The hardest part is, is the actual making of tokens. Yes. Yeah. So I guess mercenaries, you, you could just sort of flood the board with mercenaries at some point. Interesting. Yeah. It's also a three mana, three, three haste, but it's not really because it has such a mana intensive cost. I, I would give a build around B plus to get red mirror of the wilds. I think if you can do the thing, the thing's worth it, but it's two major hurdles. You have to be able to cast this card and you need to be able to make tokens token creatures yeah and those are th- those combined to making this a card you're not going to play very often right but in the in, in the five color desert deck that has some token making like this card's pretty powerful if you ever make like a, a reasonable size token like again with that common pay five mana make an xx card mm-hmm. and then copy it even once like you're already really happy yeah for sure and it's a minimum once because garrett gives the ability to himself right so and then plus any other random creatures you have can can do it too uh Annie joins up. Probably not, right? Uh, This is one red, green, white for a legendary enchantment at rare. And it says, when Annie joins up, enters the battlefield, it deals five damage to target creature or planeswalker on opponent controls. And if a triggered ability of a legendary creature you control triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. I mean, four mana to deal five is fine, but not exciting. But the cost on this is just so like yeah. difficult to meet that you like again. The, we're, we're, I'm evaluating the three color cards mostly in the cons in the in the kind of the context of the deserts deck. And yeah, you could pr- play this in some of those decks, I suppose. But you would have to. Yeah, you're just not going to love this card either way. Like that, that's how I see it. I you know four mana sorcery deal five is just okay. 
And this one's very difficult to cast and it has a very, very narrow extra ability. I would assume that under most circumstances, this just isn't going to be a thing. If yeah. you can put it all together, it's probably worth a slot in your deck, but even then it's probably going to be a C plus or something. And that's if you put it all together on average, I would just give it an half. Yeah. I mean, if you are the desert deck and the casting cost of this isn't too much of a burden, you probably have you like probably can two to it. four legends in your deck. So maybe mm -hmm. you'll get something out of that too, you know, but they have to have triggered abilities. Yeah. So you may have a legend that doesn't have a triggered ability like get red or whatever. So yeah, I would, I would say on average, if you never put this, consider this card, you'd probably be better off, but there's probably one deck over your drafting career for outlaws that it would fit into. So keep your eye out for that. Yeah, basically that. You'll also be Annie, able to on get the other it whenever hand. you want. Yeah, Annie Flash the Veteran. What does that one do? Three red, green, white for a four, five legendary human rogue mythic. So an outlaw has Flash. When any Flash enters the battlefield, if you cast it, return target permanent with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So straight up to the battlefield. And then whenever any Flash becomes tapped, exile the top two cards of your library and you may play them this turn. Sweet. Yeah, great card. That's awesome. And I really love the stat line of four, five. Like that is difficult it's, it's, to it's kill. Beefy. Awesome blocking. E you can attack and see this thing getting through because it just needs to become tapped. So you just turn the thing sideways and boom, you're looking at those two cards. Wow. That's a great card. That's a really cool card. I yeah, would say I like a minus Flash. for any flash. Cause like, it is not that difficult to imagine a situation where you get to ambush something pretty relevant. <laughs> ambush something, get something back, and then attack and draw two cards. Yeah. Like, so that, that turn do you like is four a disaster for, for yeah. your opponent. So, <laughs> I like A minus. It's expensive. It's three colors. You know, that's yeah. something you got to keep in mind. Uh, a minus for Annie. Next is Kellen joins up. This is um, blue, green, white for a legendary enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you may exile a non-land card with mana value three or less from your hand. If you do, it becomes plotted. And whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control. Interesting. So they made the front end of this like kind of the worst of all the ones we've seen. Yeah. But the back end is actually okay. Like if you have three legends, that that's something that matters. I, I would not... like. Initial take is this card still just looks like an F to me, but um, yeah, I, I would say it's an F. And you know, again, if you have a ton of legendary creatures, you can get, get go go pretty hard with this. Like getting a yeah. plus one plus one counter on your whole squad is not a weak ability. No, so there you go, and you get the mana back off of it potentially. Next is Kellen the Kid, which is uh, blue, green, white for a three three legendary human fairy rogue interesting uh, at mythic rare it's got flying and lifelink three mana flying lifelink three three flying lifelink uh, whenever you cast a spell from anywhere other than your hand you may cast a permanent spell with equal or lesser mana value from your hand without paying its mana cost if you don't you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield sweet that's a I mean, nice card, man. Three mana, three, three flying life link is great. And then you just get the additional benefit of uh, every now and then when you plot something or, or, or do any sort of nonsense like that, you can just put something into play. Yeah. So is this one that you would consider outside of the deserts deck? Like as a splash? Yeah. I mean, if your mana can support it, this is a really good card. Like your green, white, get an extra blue in there. And yeah, it's not, it's not impossible to, to yeah. come up with a way to do that, you know? Right. And you know, a card like flying three, three flying lifelink is good at any stage of the game. This does not have to come down on turn two to be effective. This could be a turn seven play and, and still affect things. Um, you know, mana wise, it probably puts it into the D range, but if you're in the realm of casting it, it's at least a B. Like it's probably just a B or a B plus or something. If, if you can yeah, get this. I think like a B plus. Field. And then if you ever get like the ability to trigger, like you're, you're yeah. pretty happy with that too. Uh, last gold card is Riku of Many Paths. This is blue, red, green for a 3-3 three, three legendary human wizard at rare. And it says, whenever you cast a modal spell, uh, that's a little on the nose for me, uh, <laughs> choose up to, X, up to X, where X is the number of times you chose the mode for that spell. 
And guess what? It's modal. Uh, you can exile the top card of your library until end of your next turn you may play it. You can put a plus one plus one counter on Riku. It gains trample until end of turn. Or you can create a one one blue bird creature token with flying. I mean, if this triggers once, you're ahead of the game because you've got a 3-3 three, three plus either a flyer or probably a card, top, the top card of your library. You're probably mm -hmm. not uh, getting a, putting a counter on Riku that, all that often. That's like the third choice. Right. And there's a, a decent amount of modal spells. So if you ha you, if you end up with a bunch of them, yeah, yeah, this card totally functions. So all the spree cards basically trigger this. That's the thing in this set. Yeah. The spree cards. And uh, if you spree for two extra things, yeah, you then you can pick two of these. Exactly. So, so that's a cool. That's I, I don't like that it says whenever you cast a modal spell. It's just a little, a little inside baseball. But that that's that's a cool design. I got to give it to him. That's neat. Yeah, I think. Um, I think it's what what would you give Riku of many paths? It's like Difficult a build to around cast. B. Build around B. Yeah. Um, there are five lands at the rare slot. They are the enemy colored. What do we call these? Slow fast lands, lands, fast lands. Uh, for example, Concealed Courtyard uh, taps for white or black, and it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or fewer other lands. And there's uh, all each of the enemies. So re red, blue, blue, green, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, blue, green, red, white, and black, green. Yeah, I mean, I mean after reading all these gold cards, I'm kind of interested in these. <laughs> they're worse than the deserts, I think. Mm -hmm. But yep. like the, the common deserts that ping, but... They're, they're still like a C, C plus level card where you should probably put this in your deck if you, if you know, you should probably take it above like average playables to make it so your mana works a little better. Okay. Um, so that's it for the regular rares and mythics that we'll be seeing, but there are multiple extra sheets. This next one is the most important sheet. Um, this is the breaking news. So there are one of these per pack. Uh, we are going to switch gears a little bit as far as set review goes. We're going to go through each of these, but if they are, th many of these are just straight up unplayable and we're not going to spend a lot of time explaining why, um, you know, we, we're going to just say, Hey, it, you just don't need to worry about this card and move on to the next. And so we'll be a little quicker, um, with these cards, but we're going to go over all of them. So the first one, and by the way, these are ridiculous. They, they're supposed to look like they're printed on some like, uh, you know, Wild West newspaper called the Prosperity Post, but they're just kind of difficult to read and weird to look at. But at any rate, the first one is Fell the Mighty, which is four and a white for a sorcery. This one's rare in this case, and it says destroy all creatures with power greater than target creatures' power. So the ideal case is you have the smallest creature on the right. battlefield and, and you get to and you get to target your your two two and they have all three threes or whatever. But uh, I think overall it's like, it's a semi wrath. Sometimes they have a small creature. Like you both have a two, two and there's other bigger creatures. Like there's some play to this. It's probably like a B overall. So there's yeah. just a lot of ways to kind of make this, make this function. But it's just not as good as a regular wrath, right? Yeah. I, I think that generally it's not as reliable, but it has the upside of sometimes it kills their stuff and not yours. Yeah. If you have three two twos and they have all bigger creatures, it's awesome. And then it's awesome. Yeah. Uh, next is. Fierce Retribution, which is one and a white for an instant. It says destroy target attacking creature, and it has cleave for five and a white that says you may cast a spell for its cleave cost if you do remove the words in square brackets, which it just becomes destroy target creature. Yeah, I mean, destroy target five. creature is is for for two destroy target attacking creature for two mana is a card I'll play in a bunch of my decks. Definitely. So. And then you can just randomly spend six to, to wipe something out. So, you know, that's a C ish level removal spell that one's uncommon next one is journey to nowhere one in a white enchantment when it etbs uh exile target creature and when journey to nowhere leaves the battlefield return the exile card to the battlefield under its owner's control this is Great. a premium removal spell yeah so it's like a b plus there's no there's yep. no cost restrictions or anything it's just two mana exile target creature that's great. Yep. And that's also at Uncommon. Next one is Leyline Binding, five and a white enchantment with Flash. This one's uh, Mythic Rare here, and it has Domain. It costs one less to cast for each basic land type uh, among types that you control. And when it enters the battlefield, you exile a non-land permanent and an opponent controls until Leyline Binding leaves the battlefield. So we don't want to pay six for this. It's almost impossible to, actually. Uh, <laughs> actually, it is. So generally speaking, it'll be discounted by two. 
for four mana and a four and mana instant speed fine. oblivion ring is great yeah and, it's, so, and it hits anything so that's good yeah, sometimes it'll cost three mm -hmm. the, note the deserts don't count as land types so the five color ah. desert deck actually doesn't want this at the same rate you might think because okay. sometimes you end up with like not that many basics but even then it's still going to be fine so yeah i would give it a b yeah i like b for leyline binding uh, next is Pariah, which is two and a white for an enchantment aura at rare. It enchants a creature, and all damage that would be dealt to you is instead dealt to enchanted creature. It's a mean card. That's an old card too, right? Yeah, so the, the joke here is that you put it on their creature, and then they can't deal damage to you until that creature dies. Right. So it's kind of like three mana, kill your best creature, take a turn off of getting attacked. Right. If he, if it all soaks goes up all that damage. Yeah, they they the damage does not carry over. It all goes to it. Um is this a reliable removal spell? I think it's okay. It, when it goes wrong, it goes really wrong. They, mm -hmm. You pry their creature, they attack you. You're like, "Okay, no blocks." They're like, "Okay, bounce my creature." Yeah. <laughs> take take you, a bunch you, of damage. You're dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it also doesn't shut off any activated abilities like the creature's still there. It's not an oblivion ring. Right. And they can block with the creature, so like Yes. If you put it on their 4-4 four four and they don't care about damaging you, they might just sit there and start doing other stuff. And then you're like, oh, I guess I can't attack into that 4-4. Four four. So it, it kind of looks like a D to me. It kind of sucks. Yeah, let's give it, it just, a D. Just, <laughs> your opponent has so much control over what happens, and there's a lot of ways it can go wrong. So next, I, I, I would mostly avoid Pariah. I agree. D for Pariah. Next is probably the second best removal spell ever. It's Path to Exile. It's white for an instant. Uh, in this case, it's at the rare slot for this uh, spot, but it's exile target creature as controller may search a library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle. That's goat tier removal. I mean, yeah, it's fantastic. The the drawback is it, it matters uh, pretty costly in the first like five turns of the game, and mm -hmm. and a lot less so later. But in exchange, you get one mana instant speed exile. So yeah, I, I would give this an A minus. Like Path to Exile yeah. is just a fantastic way to kill things. It is, and that moves us to blue, which is. <laughs> your favorite three blue blue for archive trap <laughs> it's an instant trap it says that if opponent search their library this turn you can pay zero instead of pay its mana cost and it mills the opponent for 13 cards yeah this, so can i play this you you said you did <laughs> so what would your grade be if i if i if you didn't know that i put this card in my deck i would give it an f yeah I actually think it's not an F and for a very specific reason, which is that I played this card in the early access event with two slick shot lock pickers. Okay. So those are the two in a blue with plot two threes that let you cast a spell flashback or give a spell flashback cast out of your graveyard. And the reason that it was so sick is I just plot one on three, turn five, I pass, end of their turn, archive trap them, untap, <laughs> pl play the lock picker from plot, archive trap them. And that was just a win. That's 26 cards. That's 26 just right up, right up there, which in a normal game, they're not going to be able to complete the rest of it, you know? No, they can't. Like, they can't. Because remember, you draw seven to start, so your library really starts at 33, right? And if you've already hit them for 26, that gives them seven total draw steps. Like, that, they're not going to win the game in that time frame usually. Yeah. So, um, so build around potential for it, archive trap. It's a build around a, I think if you can mm -hmm. pick up a couple of those and some of the deep muck desperados, that's the two in a blue two, four that when you come to crime mills them for three, yeah. you can make a legit mill deck. I had two of those also. Okay. And what, what happens is if you draw a desperado plus an archive trap, the desperado mills them for like maybe nine to 12, the trap for another 13, that's often going to be enough. And if, okay. you know, or you end up with a, drawing archive trap plus slick shot and that's just the 26 ball right there so like that's just mm -hmm. you know exactly what you want and on then its, on you, its own it is an f right yeah it, you can't just put this in a deck and have it function like that doesn't that doesn't do anything okay so and build, then, a, build around a i think it's a build around a where if you the, the the fail case is you draw like desperado plus slick shot and don't have anything to do with it but i mean realistically that's not how it's going to play out that often Okay, next is Archmage's Charm. It costs blue, blue, blue. It's an instant. It says, choose one, counter a spell. Target player draws two cards or gain control of target non-land permanent with mana value one or less. So that's obviously a powerful effect. Question is, can we cast it or the timing on casting it, is it still worth it at triple blue? Yeah, I think, I think that if you can afford to put this card in your deck, it's pretty good. Like okay. blue, blue, blue to counter a spell is just okay. Draw two cards is pretty good. 
stealing a permanent is not going to come up that often in limited. Like it's not like constructor where people play really pushed ones, but the, the casting cost is so harsh that I'm not really going to like the, the effects here aren't so powerful. This isn't like a three, four flying lifelink that I'm going right. to go out of my way to put in my deck. You right. Know? So I would say I, it, it's like a D level card probably because of the yeah. cost. Yeah. It's it's good if you can cast it. It's good enough to make the cut. You know, it brings it up to the C plus B minus range, but still never really blows your mind. Uh, next is Commandeer, which is five blue blue for an instant. And it says, uh, gain control of target non-creature spell. You may choose new targets for it. And you may exile two blue cards from your hand rather than pay this spell's mana cost. <laughs> this is one of those things that has such huge blowout potential, but it does cost a lot either seven mana or two other blue cards out of your hand. You're not putting this card in your deck. Like, <laughs> okay, I, I can't do it. <laughs> it's it's too much. Like, it, all right, it's a really funny card, and like, I could definitely see times when this card could 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 kind of get there. But like, you're, you're, I don't think you're supposed to play this card. Like, no, if, if you could do creatures, it would be something you could consider. But it's non-creature spell, so like, it's way too situational to have to wait, leave up seven mana or, you know, yeah. get rid of three cards. I mean, F, you just neither cost is that realistic. Right. So F for commandeer. Next is essence capture. That's blue, blue instant counter target creature spell. Put a plus one, plus one counter on up to one target creature you control. It's a strong card if you That's if you can card. cast it. Double blue is, is a little tricky. It's going to be awkward at times, but it's like a C plus level card. I'll just give it a C. C, C for essence capture. Well, this next yeah. one is maybe the best counter spell ever printed. It's blue, blue for an instant. This one's mythic. By the oh, way, essence what? capture is uh, <laughs> is at um, uncommon. What'd you say? Oh, you said best counter spell ever printed, but you're not talking about forcible. So I was kind of confused. Uh, okay. We could have that talk. Uh, so <laughs> this is mana drain, counter target spell at the beginning of your next main phase. Add an amount of colorless mana equal to that spell's mana value. This card's really mean. Like, you just yes. counter their three drop, and then you cast six drop on your turn, and it's like, oh, okay. I mean, if you haven't played with this card before, like, it is... <laughs> it is so stupid. <laughs> it is it is, a, it is a ridiculous card. It so really is. <laughs> imagine the scenario where you're just like, island go, island go. They play their... They're on the play. They play their three drop. You're like, manage on your three drop, untap, play a six drop. Right. And it just gets sillier from there, manage on a five drop, and then you just have tons of mana. There's obviously no downside to this card besides, I guess, it costing double blue. But plot does make it a little worse. You pass with drain up, and their turn is okay. Spend four to plot my lone shark. Sure, you're like kind of a bummer. But yeah. still, mana drain is mana drain. Like it's just a re completely ridiculous card. It's so obscene. Right, and you are going to counter something at some point during the course of the game, regardless of what they do. And when you do, the tempo swing is going to be absolutely obscene in your favor. The, I am curious, what grade? Do you get like is mana drain an A? I would give it an A, yeah. Okay, I, I think it I, I is. Mean, it, it's just a weird. I mean, realistically, pick one, pack one. I think I would take the five five green rhino thing over mana drain. I think so too. Which you know, mana drain is great, but like double blue, it's a counter spell. You won't always spend the mana. They have plot. Like I would rather just take the card that wins me the game every time I draw it instead of a card that wins me the game a lot of the time I draw it. Right, like every format in Magic, it's better to be proactive now than reactive. But still, Mana Drain, if you're going to be reactive, goat tier. Next is Mind Break Trap. This is two blue blue instant trap. If an opponent casts three or more spells this turn, you can pay zero rather than pay its spells. Mana cost, and it exiles any number of target spells. That's just going to be an F for limited, right? Yeah, I don't four, think four that mana you're going to put this card in your deck. Yeah. Next is Repulse, which is two and a blue. For an instant return target creature to its owner's hand, draw a card. This one's uncommon in this slot, and this is dreamy stuff. I love this card. I mean, I I, I hope this is my first pick, first pack of this entire format. Uh, it's just such an efficient... Repulse? <laughs> yeah, it was oh, such an, it's great. such an efficient card. Like, two and a blue to bounce something and then get to play and get to draw a card and just like basically keep going. Like it takes away the downside of these cards. Yeah. There, there's really no point where this card is bad. So right. I think repulse is like, I mean, it's like a B plus it's not like an a level card, but it's about as good as it gets. Like it, this card is really, really strong. It is. It kills tokens and you get the card back. It's great. Uh, that moves us to black, uh, which is, uh, 
the first one is two and a black. It's Heartless Pillage. It's a sorcery, and it says target opponent discards two cards, but raid, if you attack this turn, you get a treasure token as well. Nah. I mean, I think this card's fine. Like, Is it? Y- you spend... You spend uh, three mana to mine rot them, which is not terrible. And then mm-hmm. you you then get to get a treasure back if you've attacked them. Like this card was totally fine when it was in cons. And I think it's totally fine here. D- does plot make it worse? Like uh, you're more likely to find them with no cards in hand, but they still technically have no, those spells the plot, floating. The plot cards they could have just cast. Like it's not going to be, mm-hmm. it's not going to be dramatically different there. I don't think. Okay. Eh, I'm not a huge fan. I, I'll give it a D. You you want to go like a C range for pillage? I'll just give it a C. I think okay. yeah, I think I think it's fine at That's C. That's also a speed of the format thing. You know, if it's really fast, these cards get a little tricky. Uh, next is Imps Mischief. This is one in a black for an instant. This one's rare. It says change the target of target spell with a single target. You lose life equal to that spell's mana value. This is a six sideboard card. If if you know they have a bunch of like spells that that you can you can get value from like this this card actually can go pretty hard so this i can like redirect their removal spell to their own creature yeah that's that that's i mean that's the joke but, but like, you i get... lose life equal to that spell's mana cost yes so like if they play a three mana removal spell and also uh spree is nice because i think the spree cards cost one mana like oh really i think so yeah that's their yeah. mana cost okay so, so redirecting a spree card doesn't cost you very much. Like a one mana spree card with a bunch of add-ons is one. But mostly it's about having the targets. Like if I played against black red, I would probably just put this card in my deck because I would, you know, if, after game one, obviously you get to see some cards. Like if they have a bunch of removal spells and you retarget one, yeah, you lose three or four life, but you just two for one them. You kill their creature and the removal spell. That That's pretty huge. That is pretty good. Okay. So sideboard B... Yeah, it's a sideboard B. It's a really okay. good card out of the sideboard. Like when you get when you get imps mischief, it's it is savage. <laughs> here's here's murder. It just won't go away. Uh, one block black instant destroy target creature. This is more for flavor, I think. Um, yeah, here, but it's still a fine card, right? Like you know, even in in the last set where it was, it didn't really shine. It was still a card that you could put into your deck. It just you know it wasn't a priority. I guess I would assume similar here. Maybe it's a little better here. Like slower the format, the better murder gets. Generally, it's been a pretty good card. It's just recently that it's become kind of on the fringe. Yeah, I, I bet this card is totally fine here. Yeah. Like I don't think I don't think murder is has fallen off so badly that every time we see it, I'm I'm gonna call it bad. I, right. Know? I agree. It's, you know, it's usually like a C plus. In some formats, it can be like a B minus. So it's probably like a C plus here. Yeah. Where it was more like a C minus in the last format. Uh, Next is Overwhelming Forces, which is six black black for a sorcery. Destroy all creatures, target opponent controls, draw a card for each creature destroyed this way. I mean, it effectively says eight mana win the game. The question is, can you, can we cast eight mana spells? I think that some decks will be able to, like if you're playing five color deserts and you have multiple of like map the waste where you're like spending four to get two lands and stuff like that. Yeah. When I played that deck yesterday, I ended up with a lot of mana in a bunch of the games. And you would have been so, happy with an overwhelming forces. Uh, I would have had to change my mana base a little bit, but I think I would have tried playing the card. I mean, I don't it know is it an incredibly good. powerful magic, especially for limited. Yeah. I mean, so we'll give it a build around B plus. It's like I'm, a build around B plus where like, if you can get to eight, it's eight mana win the game. Yeah. And this actually is win the game. It kills all their creatures and you draw a bunch of cards. Yeah, like, it just slams you're, them. You're not, you know, you're, you're, they're not really coming back from that very often. So, yeah, I think eight mana win the game cards are pretty legit. Okay. Yeah, just you have to build around it because on a normal game, you're not going to be casting it. Next is one we talked about before, reanimate black for a sorcery. Put our creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. You lose life equal to its mana value. How good is Reanimate in a in a normal limited set? It's an A. It's just a flat. It's that a. good, huh? It's one mana. Yeah. It's one mana to get the best card in any graveyard. Yeah. Like, it's so cheap. I mean, I, I, you, you can mill like Desperate Bloodseeker on turn two, mill yourself and try to hit something big, or mill yep. them if you think they have bigger cards. Yeah. <laughs> like either and, of those and then things of course work just out really kill nicely. your thing. Reanimated is like a time honored combo, and yeah. you can sometimes do it in the same turn. I mean, what a huge swing. They play their five mana, whatever, uncommon or rare, and you kill it and reanimate it in the same turn. It's just like the game just completely swung on its head. Or you kill it end of turn, untap, reanimate it, and play a four drop, and they're just so far behind. All right, A for reanimate. Next is surgical extraction. Can we just skip it? We're not playing it, right? 
No, it's a zero. It's, a, like, it's an F. Slight, slight correction that if your opponent uh, has a bunch of reanimate type effects, like is a black green deck with a bunch of raised dead, maybe you could side it in. But honestly, mm-hmm. I'd rather people just default to not siding it in than, yeah, you know, than, it would than, be a than think very it's good. weird situation where you you brought in a surgical extraction. And then last black card is Thoughtseize. Black for a sorcery target player reveals their hand. You choose an online card from it. They discard it and you lose two life. Yeah, I mean, this is fine. It's, it's, it's fine. a B. Yeah. Like, it's not an amazing card, but it's it's a card that I think you should put in your deck. Uh, and, you know. It's efficient. If you're black, you're not you're not really looking to, to do anything too outstanding with it. Yeah, it's efficient. It's just good, efficient. Uh, red cards. Uh, collective Defiance. Ooh. One red, red for a sorcery with Escalate for one. So you can kind of go up the chain here. Choose one or more. Target player discards all the cards in their hand and then draws that many cards. It de- this Collective Defiance deals four damage to a creature or it does three damage to an opponent or planeswalker. I mean, the main thing is three mana to deal four to a creature at sorcery speed is fine. It's not yep. amazing at double red, but it then gets the ability to nug them for three. You can also uh, discard your hand and draw cards if you have a bunch of like garbage in your hand. Mm-hmm. You, you could make them discard and draw, but you probably wouldn't do that unless you had a specific reason that you thought that was good. Right. But I mostly look at this as four mana, kill a creature, they take three. That That's a fine card. Yeah, that's a good card. I, I would say that's, you know, a B minus or something like that for yeah. collective defiance. Uh, Next is Crackle with Power. Oh, boy. This is the Red Red XXX Sorcery. This one's Mythic here. And it deals five times X damage to each of up to X targets. So the baseline is five mana to deal five to one target Mm -hmm. or eight mana to deal uh, 10 damage to (laughs) to two targets or whatever. To three targets, right? Or or to five targets. targets. Isn't that what it is? Oh, it's X targets. So if X equals two then you're dealing to two targets and you're dealing 10 damage. So, uh, I mean, I guess I would try playing this if I had a lot of ramp. You really need the eight mana one to be It it is devastating if you get to pop it off. But you, again, it's similar to overwhelming forces. I mean, a good comparison is a doppelgang. Mm -hmm. At five mana, it's mediocre. And at eight mana, it's good, though less good than doppelgang at that point, too. Yep. So... I, I think that this card is probably closer to an F than anything else, but I could see it being like a build around C where if you can generate a lot of mana, this is a, the kind of card that could do something. Yeah, it's the second eight drop basically that you know you need to build around. Next is uh, Electro Dominance. This is red, red X for an instant and it deals X damage to any target. You may cast a spell with mana value X or less from your hand without paying its mana cost. You know, so you do I mean, X equals three instant speed you ding something for three, you get to play a three drop. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of the idea. It's, it's okay. It's, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's the, the issue. The reason why we're not jumping out of our chair is because if it's red, red to start with, you just never can get ahead on mana. So they try to make it up, but sometimes, and it, it turns out when you actually play this card that a lot of the time you don't have something that you want to play, or it doesn't line up to play something at that time or whatever. So it's kind of tricky to get that extra mana value back off of it. And then you're left with kind of a clunky removal spell. It doesn't make it unplayable, but I would want some ramp and, you know, something like that to make electro dominance kind of sing. Yeah. I, I think generally like, you should like probably probably not put this card in your deck. Yeah. Like, I don't think it's great, but it, it, there are, there are times when it's going to be okay. Wait, would you give it like a D or a C or what? I would probably give it like a C. Yeah. That's what I think. I too. mean, five mana kill a three, three, and then put a three drop into play is, is fine. It's mm-hmm. again, not exciting. Really. That's right. Uh, next is fling. This is one in a red for yeah. an instant as an additional cost to cast it. You sacrifice a creature and it fling deals damage equal to the sacrifice creatures power to any target. There's been some combo decks in the past that yeah, are built off Yeah, I mean, of Flint. there's a threatened in the set. So if you mm-hmm. if you take like Let It Ride or whatever, and you you can assemble that combo, it, you could kind of put this in your deck with just high power creatures. That yeah. hasn't traditionally been a great strategy, but this is a good version of that. Instant speed and deal damage to any target, like even the opponent's face, is pretty good. It is pretty so good. I. Th- my guess is I will not put this card in my deck very often. It's kind of like a D-level card. But if you have a threat and if you have a bunch of like four twos and yes. four combat tricks, like it can kind of get a little more interesting. 
out of the sideboard against a deck full of removal, it's a good way to kind of get a last gasp out of your creature or something. Yeah. It's not, it's not nothing. It's not. And of course, they're going to want to kill your bigger creatures. So it kind of works in that way. Uh, you know, that said, it's like a C minus. Like Fling is just okay. It, it, it's yeah. very rare that it's like the best card or something. Uh, next is Indomitable Creativity. It's red, red, red X for a sorcery. Destroy X target artifacts and or creatures for each permanent destroy this way. Its controller reveals cards from the top of their library until an artifact or creature card is revealed and exiles that card. Those players put the exile cards onto the battlefield and then shuffle. Yeah, I don't really consider this much of a card. No, the the people break it and constructed by, uh, you know, making it so that they can only hit one target on their own stuff. But if you're playing fair limited and you try to nab two creatures from your opponent, and they just get to replace it with two random creatures. You're not really getting anywhere. You also run the risk of them upgrading. Um, I would say indomitable creativity is just an F like it's too hard to build around on your end and it never does what you want it to do when you're hitting their creatures. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that this card's really a realistic card. Uh, skewer the critics. This is a nice one. Two and a red for a sorcery. It deals three damage to any target, but it's got spectacle. You can cast it for just red mana. If an opponent lost life this turn, it's a nice card. Yeah. You'd always put this card in your deck Two yeah. and a red deal. Three at sorcery is fine. And then, you can sometimes cast it for one mana. In that case, it's great. So this looks like a B. Yeah, like B, you're pretty B happy minus. putting this in. Yep. Skull Crack is one and a red for an instant. And it says players can't gain life this turn. Damage can't be prevented this turn. And it deals three damage to a player or Planeswalker. These type of cards never perform well limited. I would just give Skull Crack an F. Yeah, I think Skull Crack is an F. You're not, you're not putting this card in your deck. I don't care how aggressive you are. You'd rather just have a 2-2 or whatever. Uh, green. First card up is Clear Shot. That's a nice one. Two and a green instant. Target creature you control gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. So three mana, instant speed, buffs your creature, and it's a bite. This this card kind of does it all. This card has played out so well whenever it's been in the set. It's and disgusting. It just, it's like... Oh, you blocked my 3-3 three, three with your 3-3? Three, three? Okay, know. make it a 4-4, four, four, kill your other 3-3. Three, three. You right. know, like that's the sort of thing that can happen. And it happens it, more often than you'd think. And at the very least, it's just an instant. So they, they go to kill your creature and you're like, all right, well, I guess the, the coast is clear. I'll just take out your 4-4. Four, four. Right. So I would give Clear Shot a B plus. A really strong card. Really strong. Next is Force of Vigor. It's two green green for an instant. If it's not your turn, you may exile a green card from your hand rather than pay this spell's mana cost. And it destroys up to two target artifacts and or enchantments. So we're obviously in the sideboard realm here. Is there a world where you could even see boarding in Force of Vigor? Um, like yeah, let's, if you just had it for free, they, they have to have like a lot of stuff. Yeah, and if they did, I guess I could see doing that, but it feels I don't very narrow. Think, yeah. I don't think I'm really into it. I'm not either. I, I would give it like a sideboard, C minus or something. It's pretty unexciting. Next is pest infestation. Oh man. Green XX sorcery destroy up to X target. And by the way, I did say up to X target artifacts and or enchantments. And then you get double that many one, one black and green pest creatures that say when they die, you gain a life. Cool part about this is they don't need a, You don't even have any targets at all. No. I mean, this is baseline five mana put four, one, one pests into play or seven mana put six into play. And then if they have something you can kill, it's just absurd. I mean, we've had a lot of experience playing with this card by now from Vintage Cube, and you can tell this card is just an A. Like, it is. It's a flat-out A, one of the better cards in the set, for it, sure. It, it is. It, it has fewer targets here than it would in Vintage Cube, but it's so outsized power-wise compared to where it sits in Vintage Cube versus Limited, it's an A. Primal Command, wow, three green-green for a sorcery, and you can choose two of the following. You can gain seven life. You can put a non-creature permanent on top of its owner's library. You can... Sh have target opponents shuffle their graveyard into their library and, and, or you can search your library for a creature card, reveal it, put it into your hand and then shuffle. This card's really good. It's great. I mean, the, 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 the mode that you most want to use is, is go get a creature because that replaces itself. Yep. And then if the board is clear and you're not behind, you can just put one of their lands on top. So they just skip a, a, a draw step and or one land behind, or you can gain seven life. If you're, if you're, you're really in need of that, it gives you a little breathing room. Or you can reshuffle your graveyard back if it's really late game and you kind of need to go through your deck again. So yeah, having a primal command in your deck means you can't really lose a, a decking long game of that sort. Right. And 
it's just a solid card. So I, I would give Primal Command probably an A minus. Like I'm pretty happy putting this card in my deck. I would too. It kind of does everything all the time. You can even if if there's some non land permanent that's really just winning the game, you can put it on top and then have them shuffle and it kind of goes away. It solves most of your problems. It's really difficult to die the turn after. And with the power level of creatures now, like search your library for a creature card. Like that, whatever your best castable creature is, it's gonna be really good. So I like AA minus for Primal Command. It's really strong. Primal Might is green X for a sorcery. Target creature you control gets plus X plus X until end of turn and then fights up to one target creature you don't control. This is a fight, not a bite, but man, this card is a hammer as well because it just seems to come up often that they have one block that matters and you just get to go this huge creature on your side, kill their one blocker, and then smash them for like a major swing in your direction. Yeah, I, th this card was always pretty savage when it came up before, and I think that you're going to end up being pretty happy with how this card plays out. Yeah, I like B for Primal Might. Like, it is still sorcery speed, has target your yeah. own creature, so it's not just like, you know, a, a, a green light to do whatever you want, but when you do pop it off, it's very, very strong. Uh, next is Thornado, which is two and a green for an instant, and it says destroy target creature with flying but you can cycle it for one and a green to to put this, you know, to discard it and draw a card. Yeah, this makes this into a main deck card. Like, mm -hmm. it, it is a fine sideboard card if you don't have room for it for, for yeah. whatever reason. But imagine you're playing, like, green, black, and you don't have tons of removal. You have some vulnerability to flyers. Yeah, get a Thornado in there. Worst comes to worst, you can cycle it. I Definitely. think Thornado's like a B-. minus. Like, it's a, it's a nice little card because when it's good, you're really happy to have it. And when it's bad, you cycle it. That's the kind of card I like putting in my deck. Yeah, and it's... an excellent sideboard card because even if you know they have creatures with flying sometimes they haven't cast them yet and you can still just cycle it away uh, or hang on to it next is abrupt decay this is black green for an instant it can't be countered and it destroys a non-land permanent with mana value three or less not be countered not doesn't come up very often but it is no, two mana to kill you know usually a three drop or a two drop at instant speed Gets around yeah. ward, just weird stuff like that. That seems fine, right? Abrupt decay is pretty good. Yeah, I think like I think abrupt decay is solid. Like if you're if you're, it's a C plus. If you're in those colors, you'll you'll play the card and you'll be fairly happy with it. Uh, Anguish unmaking. This is one black white for an instant. Exile target non land permanent. You lose three life. If you're black white, you should put this card in your deck. The losing yeah. three life is not is also not nothing, but you Definitely. know it's still it's still a fine card. And I also I would give it a C plus. I would give it like a C plus. Yeah, you're yeah, not the three life. Well, when matters. you're behind, this card can be pretty bad. It can. Uh, next is back for more. This is four green black for an instant return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. When you do, it fights up to one target creature you don't control. You know, if you've got, I mean, this, it costs four black green, got to get up to six mana, but if you've got any sizable big green creature in your deck, this card is a major turnaround. It's an instant. I mean, this card was a beating. I don't remember what set it was exactly, but I don't when either. you got to cast this at instant speed, the fight means you're probably not also ambush blocking because how much toughness does your creature have? Right. But getting to to put a 4-4 four, four into play end of the turn and kill their 3-3 three, three is, is, is a huge swing. Mm -hmm. It was from Akoria, by the way. Um, B minus for back for more. It's still six mana. You still need a big creature in the yard. And oh, I was still... thinking closer to B plus. Like this is know. the kind of six mana bomb. Like imagine a six mana creature that fights on ETB that's pretty big. Like you'd be I, pretty I would, happy with that. That card. I would give a B plus. But the reason I'm giving a B minus is just because it does require that setup cost. Like there are times when you only have a three three, you know, in your yard, and you're like, all right, I got to back for more of this, and you know, it it's just not. You know, what percentage of the time do you have like a big enough creature to kind of swing the game? I don't know. It's probably like 60% or 70 or something, but there's still a good chunk of percent where, you know, you just weren't able to set that up for whatever reason. I would say B minus for back for more just, you know, because of the setup cost, not because of the card itself. But I, I, I hear you if, if you think it happens more often. Um, but devil black, black, red for an instant destroy target artifact creature or planeswalker. Great card. The only question is, can you cast it? Yeah. And it, this is comparable to casting murder in a black red deck. Like yeah. you're not going to find that to be very difficult. So it's like a C plus it's like a murder in a exactly black red deck. Yep. A little bit more to cost and a little bit more to hit, but mainly you're just killing creatures. Next is buried in the garden. 
Yeah, that's a recent card. Two uh, white green for an enchantment or it enchants a land. When it ETBs, you exile a non-land permanent you don't control until buried in the garden. Leaves the battlefield. And as an additional bump, whenever the enchanted land is tapped for mana, it adds its controller adds an additional one mana of any color. That's a good card. Really good card. I mean, this is pan- fantastic in the in the five color desert. Seriously like this, good. This is exactly what you want there. You know, it this card performed well in a very fast format. If this format's even just a step slower, then burying the garden gets that much better. Yeah, I think it's like a minus level removal because yeah, it kills it is. the best thing in play and gives you a you know a free treasure that you can just tap. Like not you don't have to sacrifice. Like it just sits there basically. Yeah. Like it goes on a land and you have to tap the land, but it's effectively plus one mana. You know, and it's hard to get rid of too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next is crime and punishment. So this is a split card. Crime is a sorcery uh, that says put target creature or enchantment card from an opponent's graveyard onto the battlefield under your control for three black white and punishment is green black X for destroy each artifact creature and enchantment with mana value X. This is from dissension. And and note that it's not X or less. It Mm -hmm. is just X. It's exactly X. Um, I don't know that I've played crime and punishment. Uh, How does this card play out? Uh, it's okay. If you can cast both sides, you know, you get to steal their best creature and that's fine. You get to, uh, pay blue, green, black X and like maybe snipe two of their things or one of their things. And hopefully none of yours, both sides are a little situational and clunky. You add them together. You have kind of a powerful card. Like, I think this is kind of like a B level card. If you're all three colors, this is a normal split card though, right? You, you have to choose one or the other. Yeah. You just get to to choose. Okay. Uh, what work grade did you say? B? I think B. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next is cruel ultimatum, which is one of the coolest cards ever, but I mean, I'm going to need a screenshot if you pull off casting it because it costs black, 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 red, red, blue, blue. (laughs) It's a sorcery that says target opponent sacrifices creature discards three cards, loses five life. You then get a card back from your graveyard, draw three cards and gain five life. It is an absolute devastating swing, but like, can even the deserts deck pull off a cruel? No, I don't really think so. This card doesn't seem very castable. Like maybe you could build a deck that had like a ton of ways to cast it, like a ton of like Grixis different deserts and like, I don't know, some five color fixers or something. But for the most part, I think- Just give it an F. This is an F. And if you can pull it off, that is, it is awesome. Yeah. We have to say sorry to Zambeg. His license plate is (laughs) U-U-B-B-B-R-R. Uh, and people think he's an Uber driver for some reason. Uber. <laughs> um, Decimate is next. It is two red green for a sorcery. And it says destroy target artifact, target creature, target enchantment, and target land. Now you do need to do all of those, right? You have to have all of them to target. That's, that was the joke with this card is that it's really hard to cast because you have to have all four, which unfortunately makes it the, a card that you're not really going to play in this deck. I yeah, don't in this format. Like, just an F. It's an F. Like, it's just too unreliable to get all the When targets. are you ever going to get an artifact and an enchantment to go with the other stuff? Uh, next is Decisive Denial. This is blue-green for an instant. Choose one. Target creature you control fights target creature you don't control or counter-target non-creature spell unless this controller pays three. That's okay. If I'm playing blue-green, I'll, I'll play this card, but I'm yeah. not going to play group blue-green to play this card. So right. it's like a C-level card. C for de- Decisive Denial. Next is Detention Sphere. This is one blue-white for an enchantment. When it ETBs, you may exile target non-land permanent not named detention sphere and all other permanents with the same name as that permanent. And when it leaves the battlefield, return the exiled cards to the battlefield under their owner's control. I mean, it's just a good removal spell. Sometimes you technically could pick up two, but I don't think that's going to happen very often. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you could do like the mercenaries if they've managed to make three of them, you could just wipe them all out or whatever. Still, it's a good card. I mean, it plays at like a B minus or a B level. It's just a B level card. B B for detention sphere. Next is endless detour. This is a green, blue, white for an instant. The owner of target spell, non-land permanent or card in a graveyard puts it on the top or bottom of their library. This is from Capenna. Yeah, it's from New Capenna. It's another one of those cards that it's like, yeah, this does... uh, have a good effect and if this costs two and a blue you'd be pretty happy to put this card in your hand in your deck 
but just the casting cost, it's like if you if you have the desert deck where I, I know we're not treating it as like literally we have the mana to cast everything always, but if we have the mana to cast these things, then yeah, this card works all right, but I, I'm not going to stretch my mana. It's kind of like Abrupt Decay where I'm just yeah. putting this card in my deck if, if I can cast it and it's not too hard to cast. I'm not really interested in going out of my way to try to cast the card. To, to get a one for one, right? I mean, yeah. ultimately. Um, it's like a C, but you, it's really hard to cast. Uh, next is Fractured Identity. Oh my God. It's three white blue for <laughs> sorcery. And if you've never seen this card, buckle up. Exile target non-land permanent. Each player other than its controller, so you, uh, creates a token that's a copy of it. Th- this is the ultimate turn the tables card. <laughs> it's the best control magic ever because you you effectively steal their best permanent, but they can't bounce and get it back because it's a token and theirs is exiled. So if they have a bounce spell, they just get to kill yours. There's no enchantment to disenchant. You also get the ETBs. So if they had a creature or an enchantment or a planeswalker, you know, and especially if they have an ETB, you get to just play it and uh, play for actor identity. And you're probably winning the game after that. Like the card is just that absurd. It's probably the single card that has the biggest swing in win rate, like where somebody can go from winning to losing it. Fractured identity probably has the biggest, I mean, to me, it's an a plus like this is, this might be the best card in the whole group of cards that we've seen total, like fractured identity. It could could be the best card in in, in the format. Yeah. Yeah. It's absurd. Uh, next is Hindering Light. It's blue-white for an instant. Counter-target spell that targets you or a permanent you control, draw a card. I'm always really uh, scared to play these things. Pretty strong sideboard card. I don't know that I would be, yeah. Yeah. be running, you know, falling over myself to main deck it. S- sideboard B. Yeah, it, it, it is a good sideboard card. It's like, really good out of the board. When you counter a spell and draw a card for two mana, that is great. It's, and it's there's just, a lot of crimes mm-hmm. that... Uh, you know, crimes that make you people want to put the, these kinds of cards in their deck, but that's right. It's just tough. Cause like you learn the hard way, what actually targets and what doesn't, you know, like when people play oblivion ring effects and you're like, Oh, never mind. And you know, it is a little more narrow than you'd think. Next is humiliate. This is white black for a sorcery. It says target opponent reveals their hand. You choose a non land card from it. That player discards that card, put a plus one plus one counter on a creature you control. If Whatever. you're playing white black, you'll put this card in your deck. Yeah. You know, it's, and you'll it's, be it's a two mana way to get a card out of their hand, and you even get a counter. So yeah. that's not too bad. It's like but a C. Most of the time, you're, you're yeah, you're, this isn't one of those like really powerful legends. So I think it's like or multicolored cards. I think a C is is good for humiliate. Hypothesizal, one of the best names ever. Three blue red for an instant. Draw two cards. Then you may discard a non land card. When you do. Hypothesis will deals four damage to target creature. And even though it's painful to discard non-land cards, it's almost always better to discard a, a spell to turn it into something that kills a creature for free. So you do that most of the time. Hypothesis is sweet. Yeah, Hypothesis is awesome. Uh, been very good. I've had this in two decks, actually. And Oh, it's re- just already? Wow. Five mana draw two and then discard your worst card to get a zero mana deal for. Great. Right. I, yeah. I'm in. I, it's a B. B plus? Yeah, I could go B plus. I could I could be talked into B plus. Uh, Ionize is next. This is one blue red for an instant counter target spell. It does and this does two damage to that spell's controller. Hard counter for if, three mana. Yeah, if you're blue red, it's easier to cast than a double blue or double red card. And counter and deal two is pretty good. So I think Ionize is like a C plus. Yeah, C C plus. Next one is Oko, but this is the real deal. Thief of Crowns. This is the one green, blue, four loyalty. That's right. Three mana, four loyalty, plus two to make a food token, plus one to have target artifact or creature lose all abilities and become a three, three elk uh, or minus five to exchange control of target artifact or creature you control with target opponent, uh, target creature and opponent controls of power three or less. You know, it's arguably the best planeswalker ever. You know, it's, it's in the top five. I mean, the only thing that I really could, like can compete with Oko and from from pretty much what we saw is like fracture identity. Right. I I don't I don't even know which one's better. Like obviously, if Oko's in your opening hand, you're going to win more games. But fracture identity mm-hmm. is just unbelievably soul crushing at any other point in the game. Right. We're debating which A plus is better though, because yeah. Oko is an A plus. Here's the which play has pattern. the bigger plus after it. You know. Yeah. Is like you play Oko, you plus two it. It has six loyalty. It's not going to die. Next turn, you make your your food into an elk, and then you have a three three to defend with, and you have still tons of loyalty. Or you minus five if they haven't attacked it. Right? 
And let's say you, you play Oko turn three on an empty board. You go up to six, make a food. They play a good three drop. You just go minus five. You have a food. I have a three drop. My Oko's only on one loyalty, yeah. but you have nothing in play and I have a creature. And then you start plusing Oko again. It just goes up in loyalty so quickly and can plus one. They have, oh, they have a terror of the peaks out. Okay. Oko play Oko, turn it into an elk. Right. Like just it's doesn't just matter what it is. Now. Yeah. Yeah. A plus for Oko Thief of Crowns. One of the best cards ever. Uh, next is Outlaw's Merriment. This is one red, white, white for an enchantment that says at the beginning of your upkeep, choose one at random, uh, create a, wet, a red and white uh, creature token with those characteristics. So here's the three things that you get. You either get a 3-1 human with trample and haste, you get a 2-1 human with lifelink and haste, or you get a 1-2 human with haste, and when this creature enters the battlefield, it deals one damage to any target. You just get that every turn. Yeah, every turn is great. They don't you go have to away. wait a turn, you know, mm -hmm. it's because it's, it's on upkeep. But they all have haste, so you're already kind of getting to attack that next turn. And you're pretty happy with both of them, or all three of them, rather. Yeah. Sometimes the one two is the best or the worst. Like, that's the one that's higher, the highest variance. Yeah, depending on but what you can ping with it. Yeah. It's hard to win a long game against this card, and it does a good job blocking after that first turn. So yeah. I would give Outlaw's Merriment like an A-. minus. Like, I it's would, too. It's a pretty hard card to beat. It also just completely changes the game, because basically it means that your only mission in life is to prolong the game. Because <laughs> as long as it goes longer, you're getting an advantage. Next is Ride Down. This is red, white for an instant destroy target blocking creature. Creatures that were blocked by that creature this combat gain trample until end of turn. The joke being that if a creature has trample and it gets blocked and the creature that's blocking it dies, then all the damage carries over onto the opponent. So this thing actually... It, it is swingier than you'd think. It looks like kind of a fancy removal spell, but it's a removal spell that's responsible for a, a surprising amount of damage to get through. Yeah. Right. Right down is great if you're aggressive. Obviously, if you're very. not attacking, this this card is, is is very medium. So make sure you're beat down. But it's in a color combination that is inclined to use it well. It's probably like a C plus, maybe B minus if you're really aggressive. Agreed. Uh, Savage Smash is one red green for a sorcery. Target creature you control gets plus two, plus two until the turn it fights target creature you don't control. Yeah, I like just B for Savage Smash. It's too. exactly what red green wants. It it's is. so good on a four two. You're like, make my four two a six four, kill your three three attack for six. It's right. just so much damage. Huge swing. Uh, Siphon Inside is red, excuse me, green. Wow. Uh, black blue for an instant. Look at the top Two cards of target opponent's library, exile one of them face down and put the other on the bottom of that library. You may play the exile card for as long as it remains exiled and you may spend mana of any, uh, so or we're mana of any color to cast that spell. But here's the cool part. You can flash this back for one blue black. So you end up with two cards out of it total and you're getting card selection. The downside is, is that you don't get the excellent cards that you drafted. You have to pick from your opponent's mediocre deck. Yeah, but okay. still casting this and then getting to flash it back is, is a nice two for one. It's a good way to use your uh, man on turn two. It commits a crime, which blue black's pretty into. Yep. And you can so. do it twice. Yeah. I mean, I would give a B minus to Siphon Insight. Like if there's any breathing room in this set, then this type of card tends to do well. If it ends up being a very quick set, it, it does slip down into the D range C, or uh, C range. I mean, yeah, I would give it, I would probably give it like a C plus. Yeah. It, it's right in that range. Uh, Terminal Agony is two green, wow, two black red for a I can't, sorcery. I can't blame you that these beta symbols are basically indecipherable. They are so. ridiculous, but also I think my brain's just... <laughs> uh, sorcery, destroy target creature, but it's got madness for black red. So if you discard this, you can play black red instead of the full two black red. I mean, I'm not that excited about a four mana destroy target creature spell. Sorcery, yeah. At sorcery, but I would probably play this in most of the black red decks, especially if you have any ways to discard, which I know every now and then you will you will run into. Yeah, it's it's medium though. I mean, this is like a C minus. Yeah, to me. Uh, next is Tyrant Scorn. It's blue black for an instant. It says choose one destroy target creature with mana value three or less, or return target creature to its owner's hand. So you get to kill small things, but it gives you the consolation prize of at least bouncing the big ones. Yeah, and that's pretty good. Like, mm -hmm. I think that Blue Black is going to be pretty thrilled to have this at pretty much every point. Yeah, and as you mentioned, you know, the crime aspect is good too. I mean, I, I would give it like a C or a C plus. I don't think Tyrant Scorn is going to like change your your deck much, but it's it's a welcome addition if you can cast it. Yeah, I um, think 
I think it's probably close to a B minus just because so? it's a little it's, – it's pretty flexible. For two mana getting to remove anything you want from the battlefield, like it's not always permanent because mm-hmm. you can you only can bounce the big creatures, but it still seems pretty good. Um, Vanishing Verse is black-white for an instant exile target monocolored permanent. Yeah, I'm in for that. I mean, it is surprising how often their best cards are gold cards and you're like, oh man. But you know, sometimes you just got to get rid of that three drop and the vanishing verse is a good way to do it. I think that there's going to be enough monocolor permanence that you're not really going to fault for targets. It's true that their best cards are often not going to be targeted by this. So you don't want to mistake this for unconditional removal, which it kind of looks like it's not. But it hits a lot of really important good stuff. And also, if you happen to be playing best two out of three, by the time the third game rolls around, like you kind of know what you want to hit with your vanishing first because you've seen their good stuff over the course. It's two mana. Like you're not really going to go go too wrong here. Um, Do you want to go B minus on vanishing verse? I think I would. Yeah, I could see B minus. I could just see B. It's Maybe just, just a B. Yeah. Yeah. I'm right in that range. Card. Oh, villainous wealth. This is awesome. I love it. Yeah. So it's it's green, black, blue, X for a sorcery. Target opponent exiles the top X cards of their library. You may cast any number of spells with mana value X or less from among them without paying their mana costs. <laughs> Man, this is the one that just pushes you. Like you want to do this for the biggest amount you can. If you exile, you know, X equals six, you know, you get up to nine mana or whatever. You can basically play all the cards you hit. It's pretty sweet. Yeah, I, I think that Villainous Wealth is a great build around. And I, I bet that the blue red desert decks or sorry, not blue red, uh, the five color desert decks are going to, are going to make, make good use of this or in like a black green deck splashing this as a win condition. This is another, another like eight ish mana win the game card. Yeah. You probably want to cast this for about five X at minimum five, right? So eight mana. So yes. that is expensive, but it's still, I think pretty solid. You can play it at four, anything less than that's not worth it. So you have to, Seven mana, like if you're going to die and then, but ideally you want to get it up to eight mana. Uh, I would give it a build around, but I'd give it a B like it, it, it does work if you can, you know, ramp it out. Yeah. I would give it a build around B. It's it, it, honestly, it might even be closer to a build around a, it's just I mean, a great card. It has such an obscene effect on the game. If you can really go nuts with it. Cause the best scenario is when you've been setting up for your villainous wealth and then it stalls out and your opponent's like, yeah, go ahead. And you're like, okay, land go. And you're just like tick tock. And then once they make that one attack, you go, all right, here we go. Villainous wealth you for the, the whole amount. Um, next is void rend, which is white blue, black for an instant. It says this spell can't be countered. It destroys a non land permanent. An- another clunky, yeah. but worth it. One for one, right? Like another fine removal spell. Yeah. We've seen a lot of these, <laughs> uh, in this, in this block of cards. Um, but again, casting it, 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 it's all about if you can cast these, if you can, sure. You've got yourself a C plus or a B minus or something like yeah, that. But don't jump through hoops to do so. Right. Next is oh, void slime, blue, blue, green for an instant counter target spell, activated ability or triggered ability gives you like a little bit of extra flexibility on your, uh, on your cancel. Yeah. Which you're not really going to use all that often, but Mm -hmm. you know, it's nice to, it's nice to have the ability to do so. Sometimes they ultimate your plane, their planeswalker and you go (laughs) counter the ultimate or whatever, but usually that's not how it works out. Uh, I would give void slime like a C or a C minus. Like it's basically a a slightly harder to cast cancel. I would say, yeah, it's, it's like closer to a C minus than, than a C, but whatever it's, it's a mediocre card that if you're playing those colors, you'll, you'll put in your deck. Here's an interesting one. It's Contagion Engine. This is six mana for an artifact. And when it enters the battlefield, put a minus one, minus one counter on each creature target player controls. And then you can pay four and tap it to proliferate twice, which lets you choose any number of permanents with counters on them and add an additional counter to it. And then you get to do that again. So basically it shrinks their whole team when it hits. And then the next turn, it like more or less wipes out their squad. And you get to proliferate, like you can choose beneficial counters on your stuff to, to proliferate as well. This set seems like not, you know, super well set up for, but there's stuff going on. Like there's plus one, plus one counters and stuff. The question is how good is contagion engine? It just like 
making sure that you don't die and then wiping out their board? Um, I think that it's going to be interesting seeing how this plays out because mm -hmm. this card was a stone cold bomb back mm -hmm. in uh, Scars of Mirrodin. Mm -hmm. And the format has gotten faster and the creatures have gotten bigger. So my guess is that Contagion Engine is not as good as it used to be mm -hmm. and is just okay. But I think that there's definitely going to be games where this card's really awesome. Because like, think about it this way. You pay six, you minus one, minus one, their whole squad. And then if you don't lose on that turn, next turn you minus three, minus three, or additional minus two, minus two, all their creatures that survived. And, and then that it's That is over. pretty strong. Yeah. Then it's a one-sided wrath. It's just you've invested 10 mana over two turns. Yeah, you have to get that extra mm -hmm. turn. Look, if your boards are of comparable size, if the game is stalled out, card's amazing. If they have a bunch of X1s, card's amazing. If you're behind on a bunch against a bunch of three threes and four fours, you I mean, it still does stop still you from taking good. some damage. And then next turn you kind of shrink them all into oblivion. It's also I colorless. would say Contagion Engine is probably still pretty good. It went from an A plus in that format to like a B plus in this format. Yeah. My guess is that it's going to land at B plus or a minus that, that, that yeah. is, I think what, it, cause it is even just minus one, minus one counters to the team often changes the board state dramatically. So I, I like contagion engine. I mean, if I opened it out, I'd first pick it and just try to make it go. Uh, next is grindstone. Oh boy. One mana for an artifact. Then you pay three mana and tap it to have a player target player mill two cards. And then if two cards that share a color were milled this way, you repeat the process. So if you had like two blue cards, you get to mill two more. And then if you hit two black cards, you get to go again. The problem of course, is that lands don't have a color. So they break up and anytime you hit a land, it stops the grindstone. This is an F. Like, I don't think you're going to invest this much time Even, even the mill guys giving memorized <laughs> done an F. Fair yes. enough. Uh, next is Mind Slaver. This is six mana for a legendary artifact. Doesn't do anything when it ETBs, but if you can scrap together four more mana, tap it and sacrifice it, you control target player during that player's next turn. Yeah, you heard that right. You get to take your opponent's turn for them. <laughs> it's insanity when you get to do this. Th there's two major things that happen. One is it secret mode is that it's a time walk because you could just do nothing for your opponent effectively and get your turn back. But that's like your absolute bottom basement price on this because what you can do is use their removal spells to kill their own guys. You can have their guys attack into your bigger guys. They can't do anything about it and they just lose their board. You can have them attack their creatures into your board, and you just take the damage, but then kill them on the crackback. Um, you can point discard spells themselves, have you draw cards if that's a possibility. You can just tap them out. You can miss their land drop. You, you It is... Most people just concede to it if there's any chance they're going to lose because it's just like too humiliating to watch your opponent take your whole turn. The, the, the problem is it costs six and then another four. <laughs> right. So the six is one thing, but now they know it's coming and that does change things at least a little bit. And then you, you have to make it all the way back to your next turn. And and then you're in really good shape. I mean, it generally speaking, it, it is one of those swingier cards. What would you give mind slaver? I mean, huge effect, but huge amount of mana investment to get it. Is, is it like just too slow? It's like a sideboard A where like in mm. the right matchup, you're playing blue black against blue white and you know, you just drop a mind slaver and then uh, it, it effectively acts as like some kind of pseudo wrath slash mind twist where you get to like mm -hmm. burn their spells and block their cre kill their creatures and all yeah. that stuff. But yeah, I would it, say for the most really part. It is really tough because there also are numerous ways to deal with mind slaver on the battlefield in this format. So there is a chance that you play it and they just kill it before you get to the four mana. That's a disaster as well. I'm going to try to do it. I mean, if I open a mind slaver, I'm taking it and nobody can stop me. But like, I, I have a feeling in the back of my head that if at the pro tour, that might not be the number one option to take over, you know, a, a decent creature. I think it's not going to be a great card. No. Okay. Uh, next is unlicensed hearse. This is two mana for a star star vehicle. Crew cost is two. You can tap it to exile up to two target cards from a single graveyard. And the hearse's power and toughness are each equal to the number of cards that you exiled with it. Some sideboard thing, right? Yeah. I mean, it's not the, it's not the, it's not the best, but it's, 
it's okay. Like yeah. if you if you're playing against green black, you're, you're I think you're going to be pretty happy to have this card. Yeah, probably so. Um, sideboard C plus for unlicensed. Yeah, sort of like that. Uh, and then the last one of this run of cards is Dust Bowl, which is a land that taps for colorless, or you can pay three mana, tap it, and sacrifice it to destroy a non basic land. I, I can't imagine playing Dust Bowl. I, I, I think that I think that th- this this card could be really funny against a desert deck. I mean, it just hits their desert. Well, imagine you're playing you're an aggro deck and they they have a bunch of deserts. Then you're you're slightly ahead. You go turn like turn five, like <laughs> sack a land, kill your desert. They like play a land. You're like sack a land. Like you just both spend your turns doing gotcha. that. It's not really good. The card's kind of no. like an F, but it's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. So the next section of cards is the big score. Yep, and there's a there's some there's some big score cards to cover for sure. Oh goodness. Okay, here we go. Um first one is called Collector's Cage. It's one and a white for an artifact. It has hideaway five, and it has one tap, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. Then if you control three or more creatures with different powers, you may play the exile card without paying its mana cost, and that's off of the hideaway. You look at the top five cards, your library and exile one. And you can play it if you do the thing. Is Collector's Cage good? Oh, yeah. I think, seems, I think it's pretty seems good. super good to me. Like, two mana for an artifact that's one tap, put a counter on a creature, which isn't at sorcery speed, by the way. <laughs> oh, oh, I did not notice that. And then you can also play the card not at sorcery speed. So mid-combat, you could just put a counter on something, put a 5-5 five, five into play. Yeah. Yeah, card, okay. the card is an, is, is an A. Like It's an A, right? Like you get card advantage, card might selection be an a plus. free. You get, a, you get to put the best card of the top five under it and then cast it for free. Like I, I think I would just make the only caveat, it's a slight build around, is just make sure you have a bunch of creatures so you always yeah, have a target that's, for it. That's, 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 I think, that's, uh, that's easy mode. Grand Abolisher is white, white for a 2-2 human cleric. It looks like these are all mythic, by the way. I don't even know if that matters. Um during your turn, your opponents can't cast spells or activate abilities of artifacts, creatures, or enchantments. Yeah, I mean, it, it's nice to to shut off any sort of tricks or whatever, but I would only play it if my mana base really supported it. Yeah, because it's ultimately just a 2-2 two, two for 2. Next is Oltec Matter Weaver. This is 2 and a white for a 2-4. There's another one. Um, it says whenever you cast a creature spell... Choose one, you get a 1-1 one, one colorless gnome artifact creature token or create a token that's a copy of target artifact token you control. So mostly you just get, you whenever you cast a creature, you get a 1-1 one, one off of yeah. your three mana 2-4. That seems great. Yeah, I mean, you're, plus. and if if you somehow ended up with some good artifact tokens, then you could yeah. you could go even deeper. But three mana 2-4, the, the stat line of the format, uh, yep. that pumps out extra gnomes every turn is awesome. So I would give B plus to the matter weaver. I would too. And same thing about collector's cage. Just make sure you have enough creatures rest in peace. No, right. No, sideboard, that's, that's sideboard, whatever. Uh, esoteric duplicator is two and a blue for an artifact clue. Uh, whenever you sacrifice esoteric duplicator or another artifact, you may pay two. If you do at the beginning of the next end step, create a token. That's a copy of that artifact cool so you get it back and of course it is a clue so you can pay two mana to sacrifice it and draw a card so basically you can pay four mana to sack a draw a card and then it, you get another one yeah and cool. you you can uh if you have other like if you have treasures or something you can pay sack a treasure pay two to make another treasure or or if you have any other clues like there's a couple cards that generate things but mostly it's it's basically, do you want to spend four to draw a card every turn with this thing? And yes, I do, except for that I'll probably die, but I'll be happy doing that. By the way, we should mention, these cards are not like the previous sheet. The other ones show up once per pack, but these ones show up like, I think one out of eight. Uh, it can be in that seventh common slot or something. So these are going to happen way, way less frequently than any others, but yeah, they can be in the pack, so we're talking about them. Next is Simulacrum synthesizer which is two and a blue for an artifact and when it enters a battlefield you scry two and whenever another artifact with mana value three or greater enters a battlefield under your control you get a zero zero colorless construct construct artifact creature token with this creature gets plus one plus one for each artifact you control and this just feels too narrow to me no I mean, you're I- not gonna 
you're not going to cast artifacts with mana value three or greater again in this format. Like that's right. just not going to happen. That's so. not going to happen. So F build for a, the synthesizer. Build around F. Next is World Waker Helm. This is two and a blue for an artifact. If you would create one or more artifact tokens, instead create those tokens plus an additional map token, and you can pay one and a blue and tap it to create a token that's a copy of target artifact token you control. Good Lord. So you play this, you you have to make a token somehow, and then you can start doing things. This is enough. No, yeah. we're, we're not doing this. Greed's Gambit is three and a black for an enchantment. When Greed's Gambit enters the battlefield, you draw three cards, gain six life, and create three 2-1 black bat creature tokens with flying. At the beginning of your end step, you discard a card, lose two life, and sacrifice a creature. And when Greed's Gambit leaves the battlefield, you discard three cards, lose six life, and sacrifice three creatures. It's an F. You, you, yeah. you're, you're just going to run out of uh, runway and then it's going to be a horrible card and there's no real way to get around it because you don't have any like donates or anything like that. So Yeah, I mean, could you win the game the next turn? I mean, you get three 2-1 flying bats like you're slamming for six. Um, I guess that's not really true. You're slamming. You're not because you're discarding a card, ish. losing two life and sacking a creature immediately. <laughs> yeah, so it's more like four. Yeah, that it feels like it comes back on you too quick. I agree. Um, Harvester of Misery is three black black for a five four spirit with menace. And when it enters the battlefield, other creatures get minus two minus two until end of turn. And you can pay one and a black and discard it to have target creature get minus two minus two until end of turn. Well, that's freaking awesome. Yeah, I mean, it does hit your own creatures mm -hmm. with uh, the ETB, so you got to kind of watch out for that. But you get to go five mana, five, four menace, eat one of your creatures. Like, that sounds great to me. Mm -hmm. And casting, and, and if you have to, spending it as two, two mana to kill a creature is also pretty good. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm into this thing. Yeah, I mean, it looks like, you know, it's a B plus or an A minus. I mean, it's just a removal spell or like situationally just an awesome creature. Uh, next is Hostile Investigator, which is three and a black for a 4-3 Ogre Rogue Detective. And when it enters the battlefield, target opponent discards a card. And when one or more players discards, one or more cards investigate. And that only happens once each turn. <laughs> I mean, this card is What great. is it, a three for one? Y yeah, like you get a 4-3, they discard a card, and you make a clue. And then, and then if you ever get to discard again, it, you also do it. The other thing that's pretty awesome about this card is it triggers when you discard. Oh, are so, you serious? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, that's so awesome. If they, if you play this and they discard and you make a clue, that's great. If they then make cast a discard spell on you, you, you get to draw again. <laughs> that's just ridiculous. Yeah. I like a for hostile investigator. It just asks nothing of you and gives you a lot. Uh, next is generous plunderer. This is one in a red for a two, two, Human Rogue with Menace. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may create a treasure token. When you do, target opponent creates a tapped treasure token. And whenever this thing attacks, it deals damage to defending player equal to the number of artifacts they control. They control. So, yeah. So basically, you, you, you end up doing what this card, I think, most of the time is you play this as a 2-2 two -two Menace and then... On your next upkeep, you get a treasure. They get a tap treasure. So they can't use it right away. You play something, and you bash, and they take three because they, they have that one treasure. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a three-two menace that gives both players a treasure or mm -hmm. just a two-minute, two-two menace, and you just decide not to give treasures, So which works too. So I, I would give it a B. Like I'm, I'm pretty happy with this card regardless. Yeah, looks good. Legion Extruder is one in a red uh, for an artifact, and when it enters the battlefield, it deals two damage to any target, and you can pay two mana, tap it, and sacrifice another artifact to create a 3-3 colorless golem artifact creature token. I mean, two mana for a sorcery speed shock isn't, like, the worst, even though it's not that exciting. And mm -hmm. then if you have other artifacts, like if you make clues or treasure from anything, then you, you, can, you can go pretty hard on this. I mean, it's a big payoff. Like, you get a 3-3. Like, yeah, getting to sack a, a treasure and make it into a 3-3 three, three is pretty good. Yeah, that actually seems pretty good. I, I think if I had I any other in, artifacts, I would probably throw Legion Extruder in my deck. In the, so basically, I think in the like 
deck that has no other targets, this is like a D. Like you don't yeah. want sorcery speed shock. Right. Though if you have things that sacrifice artifacts, this also gives you that, but I don't think there's a whole lot of those. Mm-hmm. In a deck that has even just two or three other artifacts or ways to make treasure tokens or whatever, I guess I'd probably play this card. I would too. And these cards are really powerful considering that they don't really have a home, right? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, next is memory vessel. Well, that's kind of the idea. I think by putting them in big score is like they don't show up that often, so they don't make the draft format too weird. But they want these cards around for some reason. For I don't know what the reason is. Um, next is I mean they're not bad. These are interesting, but I just feels like they should. I don't know. Anyway, uh, memory vessel is next. Three red red for an artifact. You you can tap it to, and exile it to have each player exile the top seven cards of their library until your next turn. Uh, players may play cards exiled this way and they can't play cards from their hands and you can act. Okay. So it's memory jar. I get it. It's memory jar. You can only activate as a sorcery. I mean, I don't think this card's actually unplayable because imagine it's as it's a five mana draw seven, except there's a one turn delay on it. Cause you, you want to wait till all your mana's up and you then also need to, uh, cast all those cards in that same turn because they can't you can yeah they, yeah they, they, they go away after that so but that I is think, asynchronous like your opponent does not get to get the same advantage you do yeah that's what i'm saying it, it, yeah it's like your opponent probably isn't gonna yeah i'm with well, you they're good they're still good no it's until your next turn it's not just this turn oh, so it's not memory oh. jar so it's it's symmetrical never mind f f f all the way down uh, molten duplication is one in a red for a sorcery. Create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types. It gains haste until on the turn sacrifice at the beginning of the next end step. No. No. Next is Territory Forge, which is four in a red for an artifact when it enters the battlefield. If you cast it, exile target artifact or land, and Territory Forge has all activated abilities of the exiled card. No. Uh, next is Ancient Cornucopia. This is two and a green for an artifact. Whenever you cast a spell that's one or more colors, you may gain one life for each of that spell's colors. Do this only once each turn, and then it taps to add one mana of any color. Meh. I mean, it triggers off of uh, monocolored spells. You gain a life? You, do, you gain a life for effectively every spell you cast, and sometimes you gain two or maybe three. And... I, you know what? I we were we kept talking about hey, if you can cast this spell, if you can cast this spell, hey, I want eight mana. I, maybe an ancient cornucopia is the trick because getting a one life or more rebate on basically every spell you cast it, that actually gives you a buffer over time that could buy you that extra turn needed to get to that big mana spell. Yeah, I'm kind of I, in. I'm <clears throat> not really. I don't really like when my mana rocks cost a color to cast. And oh yeah, that's true. I, it is well, green though. It's the color you no, want. No, you know what? If you gain five life over the course of a game, this card's yeah. pretty good. Actually, I'm going to give it a build around B. In a yeah, five color build deck, around I can B. See this this work out kind of <laughs> nicely. Next is Bristlebud Farmer. This is two green green for a five five plant druid at, with trample, and when it enters the battlefield, you get two food tokens. Dang! And whenever it attacks, you may sacrifice a food. If you do mill three cards, you may put a permanent card from among them into your hand. Damn, that's a lot. That's really nice. I was worried green wasn't going to have any bomb mythics in the <laughs> in the big category. <laughs> this is just kind of getting crazy with these green cards. It's just like four mana, five, five trampler that gives you food and draws you cards. I, it's just another A. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's very similar to the other ones we had. Next is Omen Path Journey. This is three and a green for an enchantment. When it enters a battlefield, search your library for up to five land cards that have different names, exile them, and then shuffle. At the beginning of your end step, choose a card at random exiled with Omen Path Journey and put it onto the battlefield tapped. So that just keeps happening, right? Yeah, so you you go, you have to get five lands with different names, which isn't that hard in the desert deck which is where you'll be using this. Right. And then as being your end step, you get to pick one on the battlefield tapped. Then the next turn you do it again, your next turn you do it again. Is this better than getting two lands right away that are tapped also? No. So that kind of puts a cap on this. So this yeah. it's like a C. Like in the five color desert deck, I guess you'd probably try this, but I you'd don't probably know if it's try quite going to be good enough. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, next is Sandstorm Salvager. This is two and a green for a 1-1 human artificer, and it says 
When it enters the battlefield, you get a 3-3 colorless golem, golem creature token, and you can pay two tap it to put a plus one plus one counter on each creature token you control, and they gain trample until on the turn. Wow. I mean, this this one's going straight into Vintage Cube. I was going to say, Blade Splicer. is this better than Blade Splicer? It is, right? Um, it's pretty close. In limited, I think it's in like normal draft, this is better because you get to put counters on the golem and just like over time, it just gets massive. Or if you have any other creature tokens, like your mercenaries, yeah. for example. Yeah. In fast-paced vintage cube, probably just getting first strike up front is, is better, but mm. it's close. In any case, this card is is an A. Like if if you cast this card, they, they first of all, they have to kill the 1-1 one, one or it starts accumulating value. You could just kill the three, three and hope to strand this, mm -hmm. but then you still got a one, one out of the deal and you spent three mana for four, four worth of stats. Yeah. And then any other random token, just this kind of card basically doesn't miss. So yeah, I like a for sandstorm salvager. Same. Uh, next is vault born tyrant. This is five green, green for a six, six dinosaur with trample. And when, uh, it or another creature with power four or greater enters a battlefield under your control. You gain three life and draw a card. Oh my dream. And it's a dinosaur too. Oh man. And when it dies, if it's not a token, huh, uh, create a token that's a copy of it. Oh, I see. Except it's an artifact. Are you kidding me? Except for it's an artifact. It, it dies into another of itself. And then re-triggers itself. Oh, <laughs> Vaultborn Tyrant, where have you been all my life? At one in every like 300 packs is where it's been. Uh, <laughs> seven mana for a 6-6 six, six trample that draws a card and gains three and then dies into another one that does the same thing. This is an A+. plus. It's a seven mana card, but it's going to win you the game like just so often. Oh. Plus, if this is in play and you play another creature with four power, you also do the thing. What a dream. This is, so. the, th this is where you aim your ramp deck at right here. Vaultborn Tyrant. Oh man, I love it. Next is loot, the key to everything. This is green, blue, red for a one, two legendary beast noble. It's got ward one and it says at the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top X cards of your library where X is the number of card types among other non-land permanents you control. You may play those cards this turn. <laughs> this card I think is just too much to, to kind of assemble all at once. You need to have all three colors. You need your one, two to survive. And ward one is not enough to make that happen. Uh huh. And then if you have a creature out, another creature out, you exile your top card and can play it. And that is kind of nice. You're not really getting to two very often. Maybe you have, Maybe an, you have artifact, an artifact out yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. and, and, but you still have to cast them slash play them. Yeah. And it's also, again, three mana of different colors for a one, two. This looks like a uh, card you really shouldn't put in your deck. I'm, I'm thinking like F that. for loot. Yeah. I mean, if it sat around forever, it would be quite good, but I agree. Next is pest control. This is black, uh, white for a sorcery. Destroy all non-land permanence ugh, with mana value one or less, and you can cycle it for two. Looks like quite the card in like eternal formats it with does. moxes and stuff like that. Yeah. But, uh, I, I kind of like it. Cycling two really just t makes every situational card much less situational because they're always just two draw mm -hmm. card kills all tokens kills a bunch of tokens mostly or one drops like there, there's some decks where this will be yeah. good against i would still sideboard it like i wouldn't want to main it but i would uh, be pretty happy to sideboard i don't it. hate main decking this i don't really know. cycling's a big cost man like you can't just go around it is, spending your mana cycling when you pick up like multiple things with that it, is true good. yeah you kill three mercenaries with it or something like that's that's yeah, a yeah. big swing. <laughs> the, our next one is lost. Oh, sorry. What, what's our uh, grade on pest control? Probably like a C. Like you build a uh, cyborg C. You cyborg. Yeah, something like that. C plus. Uh, mm -hmm. Lost Gite. It's a uh, one mana. It's a legendary artifact uh, equipment, and it it's got equip one, and it says whenever equipped creature deals combat damage, put a charge counter on it, not two like the original Gite, okay. and you can remove a charge counter to untap target land or target creature can't block this turn, or put a plus one, plus one counter on equipped creature. And the equips one? Yeah, I mean, this card's pretty good. Baby Gita, yeah, that's not too bad. I played against uh, Corticals. He had this. It, it didn't it didn't help him enough to win, obviously, but uh, <laughs> he, he, he did have it. And it. It stacks up counters pretty quickly. Like, you could, like, play this turn one, play a two drop, turn three, equip, play another two drop. You attack, your creature's now growing every turn. That's like the main thing. And then you can sometimes go like ramp out a four drop a, a turn early. That's a cool card. Or make two things unable to block. Like it just accumulates good value. I actually think this is probably like a B plus. I do too. I, I don't really like that they burned the GTA 
history on this gta equity on this <laughs> yeah it's just like whatever but it does look really strong like bb plus what about lotus ring it's three mana for uh and another equipment it's an artifact it's got indestructible and it is equipped three Ooh. an equipped creature gets plus three plus three vigilance and can tap and sacrifice itself to add three mana of any one color <laughs> becomes a lotus <laughs> yeah i mean it turns you into a lotus but plus three plus three in vigilance three to cast three to equip Mm-mm. that that's eh, that's not quite good enough. I it's think this close. is probably like a D. It's probably like a you D. You don't really want to sack your creatures either. That no. doesn't really make sense. Uh, next is Nexus of Becoming. This is six mana for an artifact. At the beginning of combat on your turn, draw a card. Then you may exile an artifact or creature card from your hand. If you do, create a token that's a copy of the exiled card, except for it's a 3-3 golem artifact creature in addition to its other types. But you could just exile like random cheap artifact and you just get a 3-3. Or creature. Or just a random, any other, any creature. I mean, you also, you also get the ETB ability if there is yeah. I, if And and you get all the other stuff too, You also right? don't like, have to. It's a six yeah. mana draw card every turn. It, and it, yeah. And you get the card back almost immediately. Yeah, it's okay. the beginning of combat, so. So the upfront cost is steep and it doesn't do anything right away unless you can make the golem. Which you probably but can. It's pretty easy to. You're drawing yeah. a card and you have a creature. And, yeah. and like you just feed it a two drop and get a three three. Or if you have a cool ETB, you just give it that. That's awesome. I mean, yeah. Yeah. XL a loan shark, put a three three into play, draw a card, because you've already played this card. There you go. I would I, give Nexus of Becoming probably an A minus. I feel yeah, like I think so too. I feel like if my opponent played this and immediately made a three three, I would not be able to kill them through the three, three, and then feel like I was losing to the howling mine, which is the main thing that's happening. Right. And I would make the three, three basically every single time that I could, cause it's just so much better to not have to pay mana, <laughs> even if the yeah, creature was going to be slightly great. better. Yeah. Um, also it has that thing I mentioned before where it changes the game to a very simple game plan for you of just make this game go long. That's it. Mm -hmm. You will win. Ooh, well, sword. it does what you need to make the game go long. It gives you a bunch of zero mana three threes. Wow, it's your dream sword here, Luis. The Sword of Wealth and Power. <laughs> it's a three-mana artifact equipment equipped two, and it looks like it follows the template that we've had for these swords for a while. Equip creature gets plus two, plus two, and has protection from instants and from sorceries. That's pretty good. And whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. When, the next, when you next cast an instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell, you may choose new targets for the copy. You know, this stuff's all relevant for limited. Like some of them are kind of like, what? You know, it's dealing with like know, graveyard stuff or something like that. But this one's just kind of like most removal is an instant or a sorcery. So your creature, you know, they have a Once much harder equipped, time it's, killing it's it. safe, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty safe. And treasure tokens are very good in limited. They smooth out a lot. And you do cast instants and sorceries fairly often doubling those up can be huge because those are your removal spells. Yeah. And I mean, frankly, three mana, two to equip for plus two, plus two is, is something, you know, that's not zero either. So sort of wealth and power looks really good. I, I think if you had any number of creatures in your deck, like a reasonable amount, you know, over 12 or something, this card would be pretty good. Your opponent's going to not know whether you have a spell to copy. So sometimes they'll chump even when you actually don't mind it. Yeah. And if you have any spell to copy after hitting them, like you're pretty happy with that result. Definitely. This is a, this is a very powerful, um, gosh, you know, I might give it like, I'm, I'm struggling between B plus and a minus. Just do the a minus. Like a minus, I, I feel yeah. like, I mean, uh, here's a, here's, I think a pretty reasonable curve. Two mana, two, two on turn two, just cast this on turn three. And then on turn four, your opponent, if they don't have a removal spell, if they just tap out for a thing, you can go equip, attack. If they take it, you get a treasure. You have three mana still, and you can easily cast a spell and copy it. Like, imagine you just copy the time of the tune of blue and you put both their creatures back. Mm -hmm. Or imagine That's they game. double block, and then you have a removal spell to kill one of their creatures. You can't have a combat trick, though, because you can't <laughs> you can't cast it on like your own creature. It but does, uh, It does, yeah. Stop that, but... I would say A- minus for Sword of Wealth and Power. This one seems pretty good. Agreed. Uh, Torpor Orb is next. Two mana artifact creatures entering the battlefield don't cause abilities to trigger. Not a thing in limited. No. Nope. Transmutation Font. This is five mana for an artifact. Tap. 
Create your choice of a blood token, clue token, or food token. Okay, I love that because those are all star tokens over the last few years. Like those are, those are ones that we love and limited. Uh, and then you can pay three mana, tap it, and sacrifice three artifact tokens with different names. Search your library for an artifact card, put it onto the battlefield, and then shuffle at sorcery speed. So unfortunately, that second one isn't going to come up very often unless you get lucky and have some other really powerful artifact. Yeah. But what do you think about five mana make a thing? I mean... The problem is these things clues? also take mana. So you're like, play this on five, tap, make a clue, untap. Um, I guess I tap two and tap the clue to draw a card. Making another clue doesn't do that much. I really wish this made treasures instead of one of any of the three. Sure. Maybe maybe not instead of clue. But uh, like blood. making blood and clue are both kind of overlappy. Yes, they are. And I could see a, a world where you alternate between clues and food until you're stable. Yeah. This does feel clunky to me. Especially when I, you just erase the whole second ability, basically. Yeah, I think I'm not going to play this card. I think it's an F. I'm definitely going to play this card, and I also think it's like a D or something yeah. like that. <laughs> uh, next is Famori Vault. This is land. It, it A land that taps for colorless, and it has activated ability. Three tap, discard a card. Look at the top X cards of your library where X is the number of artifacts you control. Put one of those cards into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. I did, just don't think this is a card you're going to put in your deck unlimited. It's a colorless land that requires you to have a bunch of artifacts and you're spending a bunch of mana and you're even discarding a card. And you have to discard so, a card. Yeah. Looks no. like an F. Me too. A Tarnation Vista is land. It enters the battlefield tapped. And as it enters, you choose a color. It does tap for one mana of the chosen color and you can pay one mana tap it for each color among monocolored permanents. You control add one mana of that color. So it might add two. Yeah, but mostly it's a it's just an ETB yeah. tapped land that taps for any color, which is like a C. That's a C. Uh, and then apparently we have ten more cards here. These um, are the special guests, right? Special guests. There, yeah, special guests. So apparently these can be in that same slot, as I understand it. First one is Stoneforge Mystic. Wow, one and a white, one two, and ETBs. You could search your library for an equipment card, reveal it, put it in your hand, and then shuffle. And you can pay one and a white, tap it to put that equipment into play. I mean, if you have equipment, this card's good. It's really good if you have equipment. <clears throat> better the equipment, better the Stoneforge Mystic. If you don't have any equipment, it doesn't do anything. So build around B+. Plus. B build around, attach a grade to the equipment you have. <laughs> and by the yes. way, this does allow you to put in, you know, it doesn't care about cost. You can put in some really expensive equipment if you get one. Uh, next is, wow, Brazy B, Brazen Borrower. This is one blue blue for a 3-1 Flash Flyer that can only block creatures with flying, but it has an adventure, which is Petty Theft. One in a blue instant return target non-land permanent an opponent controls to its owner's hand. Absolutely excellent card. I mean, Brazen Borrower has played out so well that I'm tempted to give it like an A-. minus. I like, am too. It's so good. The combination of a bounce spell and a really aggressive 3-1 flyer is a really nice one where you can just fire off the bounce spell early knowing you're going to get your card back by casting a 3-1 late. Really good in these like close games where you're like bounce your attacker, make a 3-1 into turn. You know, it just it just kind of does it all. So I, I would say A- minus on Brazen Bar or a super powerful card. I like it too. Next <laughs> Desertion is, is Desertion? next. Wow. It's, it's a, a flashback from Visions. It's three blue, yeah. blue. It's an instant counter target spell, so it can counter anything. But if you counter an artifact or creature this way, put that card into the battlefield under <laughs> your control instead so, of in its owner's graveyard. So, so I want to know, like, how good is this in Modern Limited? I Creatures I are the that, most common thing that you want to counter anyway, but it's five. I think that you can actually make this card work. Um, I... Two of the decks or three of the decks I played, I think I would have put this card in it where you just, first of all, it's really good against plot. When they plot a big thing, you just kind of know they're going to cast it next turn. What are they going to do? Not cast it? Right. <laughs> and so you can kind of leave your mana up for desertion and really just get, you know, full value from there. And then it's just such a blowout if you ever cast on anything that even costs three mana. Like yes. three or four mana, it's still really, really good. So I would say Desertion's like a B. And okay. it gets so much worse against, you know, smart opponents. Okay. But I think Plot really, really bumps this up. So I like B for Desertion. Also, like, come on. Are they playing around it? It's a freaking one and eight, you know, <laughs> like, like, yeah, uh, like you said, one in 300 or whatever it is. Next is Morbid Opportunist. It's two and a black for a one three. 
rogue, by the way. Uh, and it says whenever one or more other creatures die, draw a card, this ability triggers only once each turn. We, we saw this in Midnight Hunt and it was a, incredibly good. Very, and I see no reason why that wouldn't be the case now. It's even an outlaw. So yeah. uh, I like, I think I like B plus for more of morbid too. opportunist. It, it just basically forces them to use a removal spell on it <laughs> before using the other stuff. And that's very powerful. Uh, next is Port Razor. This is three red, red for a four, four orc pirate. Uh, and it says whenever Port Razor deals combat damage to a player, untap each creature you control after this phase there's an additional combat phase and it says port razor can't attack a player it has already attacked this turn but it only I, gets one of the two attack phases yeah and it's a five mana four four with no other ability unless it hits them so i'm probably not in for this you have to like for this for this to do more than just being a five mana four four you have to play this you have to hit them with it and you have to have another creature that hit them and you have to want to attack again with that creature yeah no I, Looks I just, like a D. I mean, sure, it's a five mana four four. If you really want that, put it in your deck. Also, is this a reap? Like, I don't know this card. Reprint from something, okay. uh, but not a real set. Uh, Scape next shift. up, we've got yeah. Scape Shift. Two green green sorcery. Sack any number of lands. Search your library for that many lands. Put them on the battlefield. Tap and then shuffle. It's an F. I don't want to hear about how you can get five deserts and ping them for five. But you could get. It's, uh, it's still an F. Like, don't put this card in your deck. Next is Mystic Snake. It's one green, blue, Ooh, blue. Do put this card in your deck. <laughs> yeah, for a 2-2 two, two snake with flash. And when it enters a battlefield, counter target spell. Oh, I love Mystic Snake. This artwork is yeah. really cool, too. In, and it, it's, it's even nicer because if you're blue-green, you can probably get ahead on tempo and, like, slam this down to just close the door on them. Um, you know, you get to... If you get to counter their their spell and and put a two two into play, you're usually in really good shape. And out of the five color desert deck, they're not really going to see this coming. You've got a white red, a blue red, a black green, and uh, an island in play. Oh uh, <laughs> yeah. And, and then you're just like Mystic Snake. <laughs> gotcha. I mean, in paper, you could probably just tap any four deserts and cast this. They're not going to know. But <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I think Mystic Don't Snake's recommend. like a, a a B plus. Like it's yeah. just a it's a good card. When you're behind, if they play around it, just like any expensive counter spell, you can you can kind of get hosed and, and plot definitely makes it worse. Mm-hmm. Though it has the, the effect like desertion, where if you can leave you can leave man up for snake on the turn you think they're casting something. Yeah, but doesn't plot make it better too? Like they're playing their three drop, but they're not actually casting it until turn four. Yeah, I'm just worried about the games where you leave your man up on turn four and then they plot something. So gotcha. it goes both ways. I see. It cuts both ways. I see. But I would still give Mystic Snake a B plus. I would too. Next is Notion Thief. This is two blue black for a three one flash human rogue. And uh, if an opponent would draw a card, except for the first one they draw on each of their end steps or draw steps, excuse me. Instead, that player skips that draw and you draw a card. It's 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 pretty good. Like if they ever cast a card draw spell and you respond to this, you win. You win. And it's a they four usually mana, three concede, one flash. By the way. <laughs> yeah. I would say in most matchups, it's kind of weak. And in some matchups, it's the best card ever. So it makes it more of like a CD level card than anything else. Yeah. It, awesome, it just doesn't awesome happen. Sideboard card. It, awesome sideboard card though. Uh, next is desert. Just desert. Uh, it's a land that taps for colorless and you can tap it to deal one damage to target attacking creature. And you can activate this. I'm not kidding. Only during the end of combat step. This is from Arabian Nights. Like this is like oldest school you can get almost. Yeah. I really hope that on arena, when you have this card in play, it automatically stops in your, at the end of combat. Cause otherwise it's yeah. going to be really annoying. You have to like, yeah. Yeah. Cause in the, in the old one, it said something like after it deals damage or something. So that's how they translated that. Uh, is this a good card? I mean, it's a pretty good card, I think. Like, you, you, you—it's a colorless land, but you—it's kind of half a spell. When you leave this up, they can't attack with X ones. No, and all their creatures, like, do they want to attack a three-three into a two-two? Your desert can take it down. Yeah, it's, it's kind of reasonable. I don't know. Yeah. 
Uh, and then our last card. And it's a desert. And, and it's know, a desert. If you if you care about deserts, like, oh, man, you can search this up with the one, two. Like, yeah, that's pretty yeah, cool. Like, that's you pretty know, cool. have a couple ways to get this. I bet this is card's kind of like a B, like in the desert deck. It's a, it's a kind of a C otherwise. Yeah, and it has to be really annoying for like the uh, If you can ever stack whatever. two of these, now we're talking. Now you're in business. How are you going to get two? <laughs> I don't even know. Last card is Prismatic Vista. This is land. You tap it, pay one life, and sacrifice it to search up a basic land and put it onto the battlefield and then shuffle yeah great card i mean yeah. un, it's untapped land gets any color so it's like this is like a b like mm -hmm. i'm just happy to put this in any deck <sighs> did we do it I, I, we probably missed some like super bonus sheet so <laughs> like, dude, you know there were more non-set cards than set cards in this thing but i'll let i'll let other people let, let tell us about that <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's call it a show there. Set looks super fun. And uh, you've already played seven hours. I have to get off this call so that I can start watching, rewatching your seven hour stream from yesterday and learn all the things that you learned. Uh, and then once it comes out, I'll start playing myself. But until then, we're going to call this a show. Uh, if you want to find us on social media, Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV pretty much everywhere. Uh, you can find everything related to the podcast at LRcast.com. I want to thank each and every one of our patrons, thank you so much for supporting us. It's patreon.com slash limited resources and ultimate guard. Thanks for your sponsorship of the show as well. If you want to check out ultimate guard, it's ultimate guard.com and you can uh, buy ultimate guard products at your favorite online retailer or local game store. That's going to do it for this one. We'll see you next week. All right. Well, I have a list of like, you know, 20, like 25 or 30 cards I would consider for a cube. But what I, I want to talk about, like just the top five that I think will be pretty sweet out of the set. Mm -hmm. One is the Avon interrupter, the one white, so white, these are guaranteed two, two. to get in your cube, right? The, the, five. the five I'm going to talk about are hundred yeah. percent going in the cube. Uh -huh. Cause they're, I think the, the five, if not best, the ones I'm most interested in. Uh huh. But, uh, the one white, white two, two flash that a, you you want to you want to hit a counter spell with it or it's a situational spell so it can never really do that much in terms of a counter spell can never do anything and it also just randomly hoses them trying to play cards from anywhere else which sometimes does come up that does so yeah. I think I think that one's gonna be gonna be pretty good um, I I I think pillage the bog is gonna be sweet this is the black green impulse for two x where x is the mm -hmm. number of lands you control mm -hmm. I think combo decks are really gonna like this like. Casting mm -hmm. this on turn six and looking at 12 cards to find your, you know, time twister or your demonic consultation or, or whatever. Like, I think that it's going to work out pretty well. And the green, black, gold cards kind of suck anyway. So mm -hmm. getting, getting like a pretty solid one out of there. Do you think people are going to plot that a lot? I don't know. I think they might. It sets up a good combo turn. Like it you does. can, you, you can do some, some good stuff. Uh, Gerald, the flesh, right? The two, three for three that makes zombies when you cast your second spell and subsequent spells. I think that one's pretty good. Good. It triggers off any spell too. creatures, non-creatures, instant sorceries, whatever. It, it's all fine. Um, I don't know if this one's actually good enough. So this one actually is not a hundred percent going to go in the queue. Bonnie Paul, the clear cutter, the six mana, six, five. Mm -hmm. I think playing a, even if you accelerate this out so you have fewer lands in play, getting like a 6-5 plus a 4-4 four, four ox plus if you attack with like a creature that turn getting to draw a card, that actually seems like enough to be good enough, even at 6 mana. And it's like even a really reasonable reanimate target. On turn 2, animate deading this, getting a 5-5 five, five plus a 2-2 two, two, plus whenever you attack draw a card. Like that seems pretty good. Yeah. Black, I like black getting cheap aggressive cards. So Caustic Bronco and Vadimir Newblood both look good, though I yeah. think the Bronco's better. Like in a red black deck, casting a turn two Bronco, attacking and drawing a card sounds really good. Yeah, for sure. I I, I want to kill someone by saddling it and then vamping for like an Inferno Titan attack if they take six. <laughs> <laughs> That's sweet. That's that, that seems like a sweet one. Uh Dust Animus as well. The two mana four or five flying lifelink. Like, I bet you plot that on turn two a lot in, in this format. Or you just cast it if you're like, oh. you know, white weenie and you're beating down. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I, I don't know how, how good he's going to be, but I got to put Nathan in. Duelist of the Mind is a kind of interesting one, too. So I think that I could, like, if you cast Duelist of the Mind and then cast Time Twister, you're attacking them for eight on turn three. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. it's another card that kind of works with draw sevens, which is kind of cool. Yeah, but but it but it's it's in a more appropriate slot than some of the later, the ones that we've had, like Bowmasters and... Yeah, Reacher and stuff, which are kind of just blowouts. This is like kind of you know 
a thinking man's version or something. Right. But there, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of cards here that, that could be good. So I, I'm, I'm interested to see. I'll, I'll report back with my findings. <laughs> Sweet. 